You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 175. Develop your gifts and talents, and they will lead you to what you're supposed to be doing. Elizabeth Avian. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Well, guys, today we have an epic episode with producer extraordinaire Elizabeth Avian. Now, Elizabeth is the co-founder of Troublemaker Studios and the producer behind many hits that Robert Rodriguez wrote and directed. And I wanted to have Elizabeth on the show because, one, she's a fellow Austin, Austinite, Austinite, I think it's called, and, uh, and I wanted to kind of reach out and see uh, to not only find, first of all, where to find good food here in Austin, but secondly, to talk about the reality of what the kind of mythical story of El Mariachi and Robert Rodriguez and the $7,000 movie, she was there at the very beginning. She was in with it. She, she debunks a bunch of myths from El Mariachi, a lot of stories and haterade that was thrown around back then and still is to this day. And Elizabeth goes deep down the rabbit hole with me on her career, her journey as a producer in Hollywood, uh, working with Robert, working within the studio system, how to produce, what a good producer is, what is a producer in her definition. I mean, it was really a treat getting to see behind the curtain of not only the mythical story of El Mariachi, but of building Troublemaker Studios with Robert and, and so, so much more. So sit back and get ready to take some notes. Enjoy my conversation with Elizabeth Avian. I'd like to welcome to the show, Elizabeth Avian. How are you doing, Elizabeth? I'm doing great, Alex. Thank you for having me come and share some uh, fun stories with you. Yes, absolutely. It is. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of, of, of the work that you've done over the years. And I mean, you know, as a Latino filmmaker, you know, you and Robert and what you guys did together uh, with El Mariachi and Desperado and everything that your your giant filmography is as remarkable. And I mean, I can only imagine the, the struggles that you had not only being a female producer 
in the studio system, but being a Latina female, you were like the one, right? There were, um, and there weren't many in the 90s. I can't even remember. But one of the few. One of the few. So, I mean, it, it, is, it is an inspiration to see what you've, you've done uh, specifically as a producer. Um, but before we go down this road, what was the thing that made you want to be in this insane business? <laughs> insane. Um, you know, I, I try to be, go back to a little bit to the beginning because it encourages people. They themselves go back to that moment when you're a kid and you're starting to see what what your talents are. Little things inform that. You know, even when you're seven, even I was a huge film lover as a kid. My parents loved going to movies, spent a lot of time in theaters. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I recognize good writing. I could tell that I recognize why is a good a movie good and why some of it is kind of like bad, you know, because they would take us to all kinds of movies. And, and some of them are they fun, you know, like some sort of pulpy kind of movie or or you see Lawrence of Arabia at six years old, then you're like, okay, this is amazing. You know, like you realize, you may not know the context, but you see the shots and you're like, whoa. And, you know, my siblings didn't really necessarily, you know, especially my, you know, just in general, at least I didn't realize they were noticing anything. And, but I did, I noticed, I noticed Peter Tool. I noticed every nuanced moment of, you know, his blue eyes and, you know, when close David Lee, I mean, just all those shots. And it, then the next week we went to see, uh, uh, I think it was uh, a fistful of dollars, you know, oh. part of the trilogy. So, oh. you know, it just kind of like yin to the yang, you know, very fun that way. Mm. My father loved old movies. So when they played on TV, you got to watch this, you know, and he was not at all. My mom's out of the family in Venezuela are the ones that were in the film business. Um, well, mm-hmm. in the TV business, my grandfather was pioneer of commercial television, Gonzalo Velos Mancera, mm-hmm. um, the pioneer of commercial television in Venezuela. And but by the time I, I was born, he had sold uh, what is now Venevision and moved on. You know, he was getting older and he had done a, he had been a, a groundbreaking guy and he was ready to move on and uh, had grandkids and his, you know, his his daughters and sons and. Um, so I didn't really grow up in it, but my father was very much against la farandula, you know, the showbiz, <laughs> and never allowed us. I mean, we were se- we were seven kids. My parents had seven kids. I was the second of seven, and we were asked to be in commercials because we were very cute kids, you know. And my cousins were all in commercials, and we were not allowed. I mean, not allowed. Wow. And uh, so, but I always had this yearning, and um, when I turn. Um, for, we moved to the States when I was 13 and I started watching TV. I loved uh, seeing the pilot to things because from there I could see there was a seed of something or not. You know, I could tell. But I was like, how do you make money doing that? You know, I was like, no. <laughs> and, you know, I was very, very studious. So I went to Rise. My father wanted to be an architect. And yet, you know, I there was this seed inside me that as soon as I got my car, it wasn't to go hang out with my friends. It was to go to River Oaks Theater in Houston without anybody knowing to go watch all the, you know, high end film. It was at the Art House Theater in, mm-hmm. in Houston, Texas. And uh, that's what I wanted my car for. I just kind of plot it out and go see a movie there. And uh, so I grew up doing that. I, you know, my sister went to see Saturday Night Fever 10 times. I never saw it. You know, I was not that girl, you know, like whatever, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. John Travolta, what, yeah. I've chosen, Who cares? what I've chosen not to watch, because they're like, yeah, you know, whatever. Right. Um, but as well as what I've chosen to watch. And um, so you see that and you don't know what it is, you know. And it's not until you piece it together. I Freshman week, I went to Rice University as a 16-year-old because I studied so much to learn English and I didn't want to go backwards by not taking summer school, that I ended up graduating early and ended up at Rice University. And this senior girl uh, said to me, said, you know, come on, be, come down to with me to the Rice Players. You know, I'm part of the Rice Players. It was the theater group. And I was like, I never had a chance in high school to do any of that. I was mm-hmm. studying, studying, studying. So, I mean, just, I just focused on learning the language, really getting it down. And uh, so I was like, okay. So I went. And of course, I mean, I knew that if I ever got involved in theater, because I love going to theater, I would be hooked. And it was always behind the scenes and never auditioned. It was always for me behind the scenes. So that's when you start kind of putting things together. 
while you're going to architecture school and you see a perfect marriage of, gosh, you could be designing sets for theater or, well, at Rice at that moment, I think it was like one of the top five architecture schools in the country. Mm. And you got accepted into Rice University and then you got accepted into the architecture school. They didn't see it that way. <laughs> right. Right. They were like, you're wasting your time. You, you're, you're, The slot we've given you is precious and you're not appreciating it. Very down grading me and at the same time I thought I was working for an architect and I hated it and I love working so it wasn't the work part of it so I'm like this is definitely where I need to be but my father's like if you don't study architecture I'm not paying for it well I got to be a little sneaky <laughs> because so many I had to take so many art classes and the film classes and the theater classes were all under under art because it was such a small rice is a very small school and uh, so I just snuck them in there without him. Well, I need to take this for this and I'm doing this for that. And, you know, so I, I kind of got him in there. And uh, and then, you know, it was the decision of I really don't want to be an architect. And uh, it was very painful to have to, you know, my, I, I was daddy's girl. And yet I knew that I needed to work. So I worked in medicine, at Baylor College of Medicine. I, then I moved to Austin. And that's where things kind of shifted for me because I started working at the executive vice president provost at the University of Texas. And about three, four months in, and mind you, my film, you know, reading all of that stuff is still in full growing mode, you know. And yet I know I have to have a day job, you know. And um, in comes this young man. He wasn't even a sophomore in college yet. He had just finished his freshman year named Robert Rodriguez. He was going to be our file clerk. And... <laughs> I was the youngest in the office, so, and Latina, Latino, you know, mm -hmm. I was the only Latina, yeah, and uh, and he, so we hit it off, you know, and he had done like 20 short films, 20 something mm -hmm. short films, mm -hmm. and he showed me one of them that was a, you know, we all got together, and 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 I was so blown away, I was like, oh, sh sh shoot, he's, he's like he's Spielberg in the making. He's like real. I mean, this is real. And and he hadn't even turned it into a film festival. He won a contest with it or something. And uh, and I and I thought. So I started talking when we started talking about all this, and I started telling him, pointing out film festivals. So that's how it started. He couldn't get into the film school because he didn't have the grades. I'm very academic, so I would we took some classes together, so he would get his grades up. You know, even though I didn't need to take any classes, I did. You know, they would allow me one, so I'd take the hardest biology or things like that to get him through the gauntlet. You know, I think I got him through all his science, um, <laughs> science, <laughs> science and math, math. right? Science and <laughs> math, science, right? you know, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, but by the way, he became an all-A student <laughs> from that whole thing, and uh, and he got into the film school because I also knew. Uh, the new chairman of the film school, Tom Schatz, because I worked for the executive vice president Provost, and he was young and hip and cool. And he let Robert in because Robert won the film festival that was the precursor to South by Southwest. Wow. The student films that were there were just good, you know, and this little he grabbed three of his short films. He's already he'd already made and put them together. And that's how it all really began to take off. Uh, and then mariachi, you know, and then he did bedhead first year, of his uh, his uh, uh, production class. So I and I was like, whatever he needed, you know, making a dummy so he could drag his brother to the ground, and, you know, just ways to do things with that need because I need a dummy. I said, you don't need a dummy. So we went to Walgreens, grabbed a bunch of legs, pantyhoses, and some stuffing from Michael's, and I made him a dummy, you know, I and dressed I, it up, and it, it's it sells, you know. You oh, I I remember I remember that dummy very you know. well. I remember that dummy yeah. very well. I I, I was. <laughs> So it's fascinating. Yes, I'm and sure you've used that dummy. I'm <laughs> sure. No, look, look. Legs, pantyhose. <laughs> legs, pantyhose, and a wheelchair for a dolly. I mean, that's that's pre. Exactly. That's a that's a precursor. <laughs> so so you know, I, it was really a beautiful thing because I also loved working at the university. So there was always an A plan that I would go get my master's, become a you know, vice president, executive, but not not an executive, but never an executive because professors do that. But at least an assistant vice president and had wonderful relationships there and. And Robert, they loved him. And he was working on mariachi, you know, just, you know, writing it there. You know, the, the computer's there because we no, nobody had computers at home. You know, like, <laughs> this is 89. This is 89. We, 90, we had right? things on rice at home. You know, that's what we had. I mean, I was a sugar mama, the, the most cheap sugar mama you could ever have, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> but, you know, I paid the bills and I paid the rent and I was really good with money. I had been able to be that person in my life always. And, um, and I, you know, so, so as a result, we got all of that off the ground and things took off from there. So all of that. So the big question was, are you coming with me or are you not? You know, and it was a very crossroads moment for me. It was a very like, and I thought that business is so hard. You know, <laughs> we all know. And, uh, you know, what context do I go in? You know, how do I do this? I need to be thoughtful about because I'm a very since I was very young, very thoughtful about um, when I saw broadcast news, I knew that's who I was. I mean, I was Holly Hunter. Sure. I was either going to go into news or I was going to go into into film, you know, uh, or TV. Um, I, I, it was like clear, crystal clear for me. It's like that. Oh, th there it is. That's what I am. A producer. OK, got it. I understand now what I am. And I had been doing that with Robert all throughout. And um, so I really, really thoughtfully, Alex, I didn't want to just do it because I want fame. I didn't want to do it because I wanted anything. I wanted to do it because it's where I was supposed to be. A, my real destiny of life and mission, you know? Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, how do you guess, how do you figure that? Well, you sit still. So I had already quit my, you know, the job. We had insurance. And I sat still for about a month in my in in Austin. Robert was gone a lot of the time, and uh, and I was really, really, um, for the first time in my life, I think I was able to sit still mm. and try to listen to where I was supposed to be, if I was supposed to do it. And it was, and you know, it became very clear to me that I was supposed to. I didn't know why, though, you know. <laughs> That's the way the universe I works. The you know, yeah, the universe doesn't do that. Oh, I don't know so much. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That's not the way it works. <laughs> relax, you know, like you know, because it, because if somebody tells you the why, or the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, um, it may not make sense, you know, or oh. it may, you know, it may not make sense until you are practicing in it, you know. So I did. I, you know, I start. Be, I began to work, and, and it's an interesting thing because to me, the reason. I am in this is for the crew and the cast to be there as a person that tries to be. And, and by the way, I haven't necessarily been this person every time because, you know, life goes like cyclical, but consistently I try, you know, to be that person, including in this last movie, where are the needs, what are this? Because once you prep the movie, the producer is just, what is it that my, my other producer goes, I'm just kind of spare change on the set, you know, <laughs> and, you know, if, if you've done it right. Sure. You know, if, you've yeah, done the the if you built them, if you built the machine, the machine runs. You built the machine. And by the way, you just keep adjusting. You make sure it has oil. You make sure that it has what it needs. You do all that. But really, truly at that point is where are the potholes that you need to be fluid to fill so that people have a smooth ride? We all give up our lives you know, for a moment um, of while well, we're making a movie, while we're yeah. shooting a movie, especially. Everybody puts th their lives on hold, or so they think. But things happen every time, you know. It never ceases to amaze me how something to a crew member or cast member, and then do you have the wherewithal and the compassion to be sure that that person, if they, if they can continue the film, great. If not, I mean, I've had... For example, you you talk about John Sales. Felipe Fernandez El Paso was our set decorator on Dusk Till Dawn. He went to do um, a, uh, a movie with John Sales after that as a production designer, the one he did um, down in Chiapas. Oh, the um, and, not, Lo not Lone Star. No, it was, it was in Lone Star. No, it was... it, it's down in Mexico deep. It was oh, with the, it's yeah. With the indigenous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I yeah. remember that movie. Yes. And my... My brain is going to come to me. But anyway, but uh, Felipe's mother passed away while we're in the middle of shooting Dust Till Dawn in Mexico. And uh, and he had been my my set decorator also on Desperado. That was the movie after Desperado. And uh, he was like, no, I, I'll stay. I'm here. You know, we're in the middle of a dry lake bed in Barstow in the middle of August. And I had to sit with him and say, no, you have to go see your mom. We will do all the work. And if you want to come back, open the door for that, you know. 
if you need to stay, you stay. If you want to come back, it, it, you're here. You are our set decorator. Right. So thank God for those moments because everybody was going so fast. It was a really rough shoot in that dry lake bed. And to be able to to do that for Felipe. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, and, and throughout. I mean, Felipe is just one example. So life continues. You know, and you were laughing about how people are like, oh, you know, movie, the film business, so exciting, you know, and kids are like, I don't want to work. Why do you want to be in the film business? I don't want to be in a job eight to five. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> so you, you want to be in one from, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or from like noon to like midnight or more? You know, like, you know, yeah. okay. I was about to say, those are very l- in slow the, days. In the, heat, <laughs> in the cold, in the dust, in the whatever, you know, no, in no, the whatever no, 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 comes no, no, no. with the movie, you know? The, yeah, and I that's mean, where you really, and as you know, there are some that that is their passion. It's, I call it, I mean, I, I, once Some you get, like, no, <laughs> yeah, oh no, absolutely. And, and I've, I've, I mean, I've obviously talked to a, a, a million filmmakers throughout my career and worked with tons throughout my career as well. And I, I've just realized that there is an insanity. There is an insanity to being a filmmaker. I literally was having a conversation with, uh, with a guest yesterday, a filmmaker who lost everything, lost their home with six kids, moved in with their parents because the movie failed because they didn't know what they were doing and their ego was out of control because when you're a young filmmaker, your ego's out of control. Uh, and his only thought was not that I can't eat, not that I have no roof, not that I've had to move back in with my parents for eight months while I come back out of this. Oh my God, I might never make a movie again. <laughs> and that was the only thought in his head. And I'm like, do you understand? And I, and I stopped him and I said, everyone, I want you to listen. We're insane. We're insane creatures. As artists, we're probably one of the more insane artists because it's the most expensive, it's one of the most expensive art forms on the planet, and you can't do it by yourself. You need a lot of people. You need, you need I mean, you need a, a, a good crew. I mean, you need crew. The last two movies have yes. done it with about forty something, and let me tell you, that means the producer is Lord have mercy. You know, no, like, no, you know, no, you no. are everything. No, absolutely. So talk about being fluid. Talk about being fluid. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. It is insane. Um, and, and, you know, it's always interesting to me when you have new people that are PAs or interns oh, yeah. and you see which ones have it. I mean, they're they're innate. You know, they have the innate passion that they're so good that you're like, this guy's never really been on a real movie set. That's amazing. Because, I mean, we had one PA in our group in this last movie that was this kid, you know, that came to we're in a tiny town in Oklahoma. And he came because his parents were moving. So he came to help them. He did, you know, he he doing a little theater, but he was doing visual effects mainly. And this kid, the woman, I mean, I'm talking a town that most Oklahomans don't know. And this kid named Johnny, um, <laughs> Juanito, <laughs> Juan Andrade, mm-hmm. uh-huh. what did I call him Johnny? Because he, you know, he spoke English and Spanish. Yes, that's right, sure. And he was our intern. His mom was, you know, um, because they're in that town, she was the dishwasher in the, and she told me, Nancy, her surname, she told me about him. And then I met him and I was like, great. Oh, you can be our, our, our uh, stand-in as an intern, whatever, right? My God, that kid was like a rock star. Everybody wanted to take him to the next thing with them. I mean, incredible, incredible yeah, it's as amazing. an intern, you know? And then you have others and you're like, okay, do you not understand that we people <laughs> walk through like, like hot coals to do I have the job you have? Do you understand that how many people would like do anything to replace you? And here you are like, wah, 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 you know, it, yeah. it's, it's hard because at the moment I'm like, and what I always try to get across is like, this is a very short, intense time. The mm-hmm. shooting part of it is very short and intense time. And you, if you're not loving it, don't oh. be in it. Oh, no, no, no. It, it's just, and I've told people that so many times. If you don't absolutely love what you're doing in this business, you need to leave because it will eat you alive. It eat you, it'll eat yeah. you. It will eat you alive. And I've seen it. will make you bitter. Oh. It will make you. you <laughs> so know, this is. It, because you're like, uh, you know, it, no, you no, don't no. attract all the best situations. You know, no. If you're 
you know. If you're angry, and the one thing I always tell people uh, when I speak when I speak sometimes to film students and stuff, I'll go, "How many of you guys here know an angry and bitter filmmaker?" And every, and then a handful of people will raise their hands. I'm like, "Whoever didn't raise your hand, you're the angry and bitter filmmaker that everybody else knows." <laughs> and. <laughs> Because it's true, because we all know an angry and bitter filmmaker, an angry and bitter screenwriter. And if you don't know them, it's you. It's you. Um, now, I wanted, uh, um, so I wanted to go back a little bit to Mariachi because Mariachi is, it, well, first of all, for me, it was, again, an integral part of my growing up. I mean, I was working at a video store in 91 when that was released. I was in high school still. With a Quinton. <laughs> uh, yeah, very Quentin, very Quentin, very Quentin esque. Yes, the film school. <laughs> yes, that was my film school as well. Uh, I love it. I yeah, so I was working at a video store. I still have my El Mariachi video store poster, by the way. Uh, I've never, I've got two copies of it. I, t- I, t- I stole two from the video store. I've never gotten rid of them. And my wife's like, "What are you gonna do with those?" I'm like, "Don't worry. One day I'll, I'll, I'll put them up, and I have them. But I always have them. Always have them. <laughs> always have them." Um, and I remember when it came out, and it it blew my mind because it was the first time. To be honest, it was the first time I ever saw a Latino filmmaker. Yeah. It was a, at at a at any at any level in Hollywood, really. And there obviously had been Latino filmmakers before, but no one that really took the stage like Robert and and, and what you and Robert did. And obviously, and I talk about Robert, I talk about El Mariachi constantly throughout the years of this show, purely because I go, look, man. You guys are – people still talk about mariachi. It's, a, it's an urban myth at this point. It, it, it's an urban myth. They still talk about mariachi like, oh, you remember like mariachi. If he could do it for 7000 I could do it. I'm like, it was 1991. It was a very special time. <laughs> it was the birth of the independent film movement, the Sundance independent film movement, you know, with Rick and – and Edward Burns and Kevin Smith and Quentin and and, and Stoderberg and yeah. that that those that, that decade. Was, that was very specific time. It was a very specific time, and I always told I had uh, I had Edward uh, Edward Burns on the show, and I asked him. Oh wow, yeah. I had Eddie on the show, and I asked Ed. I go, Ed, if if Brothers McMullen came out today, would you would do you think it would do anything? He goes, probably not. And I'd argue that if Mariachi showed up today, it'd be difficult to cut through the noise. Because originally, from what I heard, and that's nothing against the movie, because there's a no, lot. No, no, I agree with you. It's, it's I totally agree with you. It's, it was just that time, and then of course all the the, the blocks that hit, you know, Robert Newman and and that whole thing. Yeah. But it was because it, it, of course the story of Mariachi, he he was just going to do something for the Mexican video market. It was never actually supposed to ever be released in English. It was just as like his practice film, all this kind of stuff. I have to ask you, what was it like being in the center of that hurricane? Because that was like that must have been a whirlwind. Because I mean, I read the book. Obviously, I have it back there. Uh, yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a bible for any filmmaker to to listen to 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 it watch. Uh, and but what was it like being in the center of that? Because oh my god, <laughs> incredible! No, it it truly. I'll tell you. Um, let me begin with the fact that the seed for it. You know, one of the things that Robert was always confounded by was that people he would hear people say, oh, well, if you go to film school, your short film in film school will cost a hundred thousand dollars, one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and, you know, he comes from a family of 10. We, we had I mean, I barely we ba- you know, we were it's not like my job paid a lot of money, but we, we were able to stay out of debt, you know, which is a big one. That's a mm-hmm. big one. Mm-hmm. I tell people out of college debt, out of, and I and I talk to young kids and, about this, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it was, and I told Robert, I said, we can't be in debt because you won't be able to be free, you know, to go do and take what you need to take. Right. So my most important thing for Robert was that he continued to go to school and for, to get a camera. So when he did Bedhead, his first semester of film was to get a hold of a film camera yeah. because he thought without a film camera, you know, I can't go to festivals kind of thing, you know, without it being on film, really, truly, uh, to the bigger festivals. And uh, so when he was able, and everybody else was spending thousands of dollars, you know, 2000 and he's like, we don't have that kind of money. So because of his abilities, you know, and his siblings, he wrote something that he already, just like Mariachi, what do I have? I got my kid, my, my little siblings. I can do something interesting with them. And, uh, and he had the film camera which was an MOS film camera. You know, it was a, mm-hmm. just a 16. 
tank. Tiny, one of those, the crank up ones. Oh, well, it was, oh, so it wasn't even, it wasn't even crystals. Yeah, it was just a crank. It was a first so you, year production. Mm-mm-mm. It was a yeah. probably was a bo- either a Bolex or an Airy, one of those Bo- old. Yeah. It was a probably a Bolex. Exactly. It's one of those mm-hmm. old ones, yeah. So, so he ended up spending, including transferring the film, editing the film, and everything, eight hundred bucks, which he had gone to Primaco <laughs> to you know to get lab tested. Mm-hmm. So he had a little money to do that with, <laughs> and you know, um, you know, in the meantime, I was helping with whatever pay for his semester, whatever needed to happen. And he was doing a comic strip that he got eight bucks a day whenever he did that comic strip. So he made a little bit, a couple hundred bucks a month. And uh, so that started sort of like his ability to go, okay, $800, eight minutes, $8,000, 80 minutes. That was the seed. Wow. From there is when he thought, I can make a feature for like, I don't know, 8,000, 10,000. So he talked to Carlos Gallardo. Yeah. And this is... He and I got married in January of 1990, got married. And so this is now a year later when he's already, I mean, then the film started going to festivals and started winning things. Mm -hmm. So he was like, okay, okay, this is possible, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, and he also did the animation. And interestingly enough, his professor at the time was like, Robert, you already have a name. And Robert looked at him and he was like, dude, this is not about getting an A. This is fast for me, you know, this is. So anyway, and I, you know, I helped him with, I helped with whatever, you know, I filled in the little cockroach wings on the animation. I did oh, whatever. so great. Yeah, I'm yeah. one of those, you know, very, very, it was a very sweet time, you know, for us. And then, you know, so he had some friends that borrowed a 16S. He had been writing and they'd been talking about it. So some guys he'd met at the Access Channel, you know, in Austin. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, um, those guys said, yeah, yeah, we can let you borrow it so you can go shoot my edge. But he'd been writing it. He'd been doing it, you know, taking sophomore year semester. But he was kind of like, hey, let somebody else write that movie and I'll be a part of it and blah, blah, blah. So then uh, he was writing it in the computers at the office. So he would stay there longer. You know, we worked together. I worked in that office still. And, you know, with, with to, and, and everybody was so kind because he, he loved these people, too, just like me. So it was a wonderful group of folks Mm -hmm. that loved him and loved us you know and what he was doing you know they saw the passion they saw the and how much he gave to the office anytime there was a birthday he'd do a beautiful he's an amazing artist so Mm -hmm. do a beautiful little poster in full prismacolor you know like really funny stuff like caricature but funny most people in the office were part of his comic strip they started getting in there as characters including the executive dr funk and <laughs> executive so you know uh so uh, for him if it hadn't been that we worked in that place it would have been harder because no computer you know right no free time in between classes to sit there and answer phones while we were doing other things so he could continue to write a script yeah. and then it was re- he was ready to go you know, and then he went to Pharmaco for a month and that's where he finished reading, writing the script. So it all kind of converged together. It's the right combination of having the right people around you that are supportive. And uh, so, and then Carlos and he already had done so many short films and Carlos was dialed in. They'd shoot their, shot there before many short films. So everybody knew them as these kids that love to do this stuff. So Carlos had a lot of, so they wrote everything around, Robert wrote everything around what he knew he had. That is really what he did. So went mm-hmm. down there and then he gets a phone call about 10 days in and the guys need the camera back. So they're under the gun. There's like, we got to And he didn't answer the phone, you know, because there no cell phones back then. So he could pretend he didn't hear that. And I'm like, they're calling me and they're asking for the camera. And he goes, okay, I need till the weekend. So the 14 days of shooting, thank God he was able to kind of stretch it so that he could do that and then drove back with all the film transferred it to three quarter inch and, you know, and then edited at the Austin Access. So all of that together is what leads to, if I tell people, if Robert got a dollar paid for every hour he spent oh. crafting mariachi, forget me, forget Carlos, forget anybody, it would have cost millions, you know, $100,000. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, easily. I mean, easily. The, the budget would not be what it is. Plus, he also did not make a film print. So that's why it's not 30 some thousand dollars. People are like, he didn't make it for, I mean, still, it's, you know, urban mesh kind of thing. Oh, no. no, he didn't make a film print. 
Columbia well, Pictures made a film print for him. Right. You know, so, and, you know and, but the sound is you, the, I, the sound guys in this past movie said, so I heard that Columbia spent $200,000 in sound because the sound on my Is it true? Not true. So, so I, what, you know, what's the, what's the okay? So this is the this is the urban myth that I've heard um, about okay. this. Like, okay, <laughs> everyone's like, because uh, I had I've had to defend Robert's honor many times at at film yeah, festivals, it, uh, at film <laughs> festivals and things like that. They're like, that's all BS. That's all press. That Columbia. He never made a movie for seven thousand. And I'm like, look, he made the movie for seven thousand. <laughs> He transferred the movie onto three quarter inch tape because I remember because I used the to developing by the way the film and the development of the film was... it really is what cost seven thousand and transferring That's right to seven thousand right the rest of it was his own time yes. right exactly uh, so then he from what I understand he transferred it to three quarter inch he cut it uh, he cut it at the access at the access. Uh, you know, tape to tape. No, I, I did. That was my first job. I was cutting reels for a commercial house in Miami. And I, I know the Sony. I know the Sony very well. No. So I, I, I edited on the exact same machine he edited on, on three quarter okay. inch. It's three quarter inch because you couldn't afford beta. That was really expensive. So you couldn't do beta. You had to it, beta. I speed. love the spelling the, the, you know, it's not true because it is true. All You're right. So, true. so all, so all of that. And I mean, and, and I read, of course, in the book, he, like he, he stayed overnight and he couldn't leave because the alarm. So he had to, he had to pee in. In a jug of water, like all these stories. So you hear all this, but then That's they go. <laughs> so and then I and so they always talk about. Well, how about the audio? And I go, from my understanding, and this is this is what I understand. And and I've done I've I've read all the books and I've done I've done all the research. I've I've, I've studied Robert in depth, especially during that period of time. Yes, of I was course. it was of course. He's wonderful. He yeah. Really to uh, to to so to my understanding, when Columbia got it. Uh, they obviously remastered the, the they, they went back to the print or to the not the print the uh, the negative remastered it all that stuff but the sound is what cost them a good amount of money to redo because you had to I'll redub everything why. i'll tell you why uh so he had a it was a 16s an re 16s no mm -hmm. sound right so he had a moran tape recorder and a 50 dollar mic <laughs> and a box of tdk tapes um, literally a box <laughs> that's, that's of insane that's that Hey, yeah, the kind that no, 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 old school, stuff, old, so yeah, yeah, with, with pen a pencil, the pencil, that, pencil, yeah, yeah, pencil, no, you're good. <laughs> those very much, yes. And he, since these guys were not actors, they kind of said things at the same rhythm, so he could match the mouths, you know, pretty well. So oh, he would go through the paces, all the foley, like they put the glass down, like the, the, think about the scene in the in the um, in the bar with mm -hmm. those three guys, mm -hmm. you know, the beer, the thing. All the sounds, the sound. So he would go up and redo the whole scene for sound. After after it was shot, so it's not sung. After it done. And by the way, and he would grab when the beer was being poured. So he grabbed that kind of stuff. The glass hitting that same table. So he was kind of doing Foley slash sound. And they would go through, say all the words again, you know, because he didn't have a sound guy with the you know, none of that. Nah, you know? and, and it none wasn't it wasn't as cheap as it is today because now you now all this equipment nah. super super cheap. So yeah, yeah, exactly. super affordable. So so that's what I was explaining to my sound guys in this past movie. And I said, so what happened is, so Jimmy Honore from uh, Columbia Pictures, the post production guy, comes all the way to Texas to pick up the elements, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he goes away with like he brings this big bag. I mean, the the film didn't even fit. The TDK tape, just like, you know, the little box, here it is. Hey. And Jimmy is sitting there in our apartment <laughs> going. Que, que esta locura. He can't even believe it. Que esta he can't even believe it. And by the way, really good sound. Because he took the time to get so much stuff. Clean. Now, yeah. mind you, yeah. you're never going to be able to project this movie with that sound necessarily. Necessarily unless you transfer it and they didn't they only sweeten things you can talk to sergio and tenny they can tell you there were our mixers at columbia mm -hmm. and yes they spent money because in order to put something on the big screen like they were planning on it mm -hmm. you know you sweeten it up. you can't show something that's in cassette tapes of course obviously, not. Right? right so but they used all that sound there was no adr man there was none of that. Wait, so there none. was no. Oh wait, wait. So there's no. So there's no ADR for sound. But how about? But for how about dialogue? No ADR for sound. Dialogue. There was no ADR for sound. There was some foley. I saw that foley happen. But Robert had gotten so many of the sounds in place. They used 
whatever they could use, they just wow. sweetened it. So, by the way, I mean, we're talking Colombia pictures, Sergio and Tenny, their biggest guys. Oh, no, 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 I mean, no. Because no, Sergio yeah. is Latino, you know, and Tenny's a cool guy. They're like, we'll do this. This will be fun, you know. Robert yeah, nobody, wa so, nobody wanted to way, do this. Sergio, Sergio <laughs> Reyes just passed away. He has still oh. been our mixer all of these years. Oh, wow. Pretty much every single movie. He even moved to Austin. So he has mixed everything. Sergio has. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So, okay. So, so, so he can tell. So right, was, now he's, he's passed away with all the, you know, the truth, which is this is the <laughs> truth. I know it because we've talked about it so much. So, okay, people so people still think it's bullshit, you know? So, so then, so then basically it was all sweetening. There was, was there ADR that, that, that all the talent have to come back mm -hmm. in? And oh, so all the nice. all the dialogue all from the cassette, TDK cassette tapes. No hold on, no hold on. All of it. So the di you, the I'm dialogue sure. as well. The dialogue all there was never ADR man, never, never. Nope. Holy. I mean, incredible. so they just so they just basically put it in their system, sweetened it up, made it professional, surround sound, they did, did as much as they could. Everything they needed to do, yeah, exactly. And then they and went back. Robert himself. Um, cut the film and a film print from his cut three quarter inch. They sat there with a the camera looking at it. So they re because okay, there was no EDL. There was, right. there was so no Robert EDL. himself literally did this and he, cut he, he did a frame. He like did a, a regular person would like an so old he recreated. That's what I'm talking about for every dollar. I oh mean, my God. Yes. If the amount of time Robert gave to this is pretty incredible. Oh my um, God. So then, still, so by the way, when I saw the film, because I'm a, I'm a critic, you know, <laughs> I'm a critic as not only as a wife, but as a film person, you know, I love, I love film, you know. And I said to him, when I saw Mariachi in the three quarter inch version before he went to LA with it, I said, you know what? I give it three out of five for the movie. If I saw this movie, it's a three out of five. If I saw it not oof, knowing rough, anything. Rough audience. But knowing the story of how you made this and how much it cost, this is a five out of five. You, you Go out there and tell that story. You know, I mean, and we agreed that that was really the thing. So, and by the way, what he wanted to do also was, you know, he was a kid that never thought he could do it because he heard there was so much cloak, you know, like these huge cloak curtains that you just did not touch mm -hmm. as a latino as a kid from a family of 10 or a family of seven sure i know yeah you you financially no you know and to go to a family I mean, we are in awe of like rick linkletter and, and yeah. tarantino who dared you know who dared you know but robert decided to go <laughs> you know, and Big just time. open the curtain and the wizard behind it is who exactly let's let's look at the wizard please okay no okay there's no wizard it's just keeping people out. So that's what he felt he had to do, which is why he convinced Columbia Pictures it was laser discs back, back then. Oh, I know. I, I had and the laser for, disc. <laughs> yeah. That for the first time, a movie like El Mariachi, because it was all criterion, you didn't get yeah. to have audio commentaries. Commentary. No, you're, you're right. You're right. You didn't. Nobody did. Nobody. Uh, unless it was criterion and it was like, $125. And it was $125. Yeah. Or, absolutely. Or, exactly. Or Robert convincing this amazing guy named Clint Culpepper, who was so full of joy and, 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 and enthusiasm for what was going on, you know? Um, and he's still a dear friend. Um, and Clint and Robert... He was like, we're doing this. And he convinced Clint Culpepper and Robert convinced Columbia Pictures to do a laser disc with the commentary. So to dispel the myths, but, you know, people still think that it's not true. And it is. It's so, it's, it's, it's so beautiful because it is all really true. I, so I'm and Robert so said, you know, people were really angry. Some of them at Sundance that he had been um, he had been um, a what do they call it? Media trained. No. By the way, Robert is one of the most shy humans in a lot of ways. He's very quiet, very mm -hmm. shy. You give him a microphone. It's, it's the opposite of the of the uh, stage uh, fright. Yeah, the frog from Warner Brothers. You know, hello, my baby. Hello, my dad. <laughs> you give a microphone. That's Robert backwards. You give that man a microphone because he got so excited about taking 
all that cloak and dagger stuff of filmmaking, you know, and that's been his life, you know. Oh, he's he been, a, truly, he is a troublemaker. <laughs> he is, a, we are troublemakers. <laughs> you guys are troublemaker studios. Well, the, and that was the thing that I, and that's one of the things that I, I mean, I obviously found an Im immense inspiration from Mariachi and Desperado and, 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 and Robert and your career moving forward. But I've never seen the amount of hate, bitterness of people to like, when oh he got in because of this or that, and I got because when you see when you see someone who has, oh he got lucky, mira, lucky and lucky no okay look the, at I the know, at, look look lucky is lucky Where but equity man Where equity listen lucky will get you in the door but it doesn't keep you there, and and you know and and yeah there's certain certain things that the universe put in place, you know, that got mariachi. There's no question the timing was right. I always tell people Robert was there with the right product at the right time. And and it just so happened that it went got to Robert Newman. Robert Newman said, hey, let's do this. And and then it, it kind of took it took off from there. But no, by the way, Robert Newman had no clients. Right. He wasn't Robert this big. Robert Newman was in ICM. Right. I... Robert Newman had that other people didn't have. Uh-huh. Robert Newman, Robert was given that name by a guy named Dom, Dominic, Cons Robert Newman was coming down for a party for the film commission here in Texas. Mm -hmm. And Robert Newman was the foreign sales guy at ICM. He had no, he didn't represent anyone. He represented mm -hmm. films that needed to have foreign sales. Sure. That they had filmmakers that they were represented. Oh, by the way, just real quick, everybody, Robert Newman is... Uh, Robert's, it's Robert's agent. agent. Yeah, Robert yeah. Newman, yeah. He's at uh, William Morris and Depp, Robert yeah. Newman. Yeah, yeah. And he has been from the beginning. But Robert was his first client, just so that you people mm -hmm. know that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but Robert Newman had been trained. He was the fourth person at a place called Miramax. And he worked for the Weinstein brothers, um, basically, when before they were an actual studio or any kind of any kind. They were just, they would buy foreign films. So they went to festivals and they physically take them to the Angelica theater, to the Lamley in LA, all that stuff. And, you know, they, they, and they worked on campaigns for those little films to get them foreign, you know, Oscars if possible, you know, that kind of a thing. But Rob, so Robert Newman was very used to foreign films. He was trained by the, you know, I hate to say it, Harvey Weinstein is a genius of sorts in that realm, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and so that's who he he was the fourth person. It was Bob Harvey, a, a British guy. I can't remember his name. And then Robert Newman. So he came from a training that he was really, really ready to see mariachi with a different pair of eyes. The than timing. Most yeah. Agents could imagine, you right. know, could even it, we just it, the, the, the serendipity, the the blessed sort of path and by the way and then it takes an assistant to an agent that is willing to open that door so when robert made that phone call that assistant truly opened that door right so it is you know i mean i'm always a very that person you know mm -hmm. i try to be that person so and i knew i knew who robert was and and i knew the purity of what he was trying to do too because it was it was pretty rough for people you know you could not get it even if you were passionate and loved the business you couldn't be in the business you know you would never dream of assuming you could be in the business let know? alone latino so let alone a latino that, let alone a latino let alone a latino oh, forget yeah exactly so so it was it's, it's a very opening of a world to so many people you know that but it was also happening because Guillermo del Toro had done his little film Kronos, yeah. you know, and we all were in festivals together with Bill Mariachi, you know, and um, we went around the world with them and, and lucked out to be as Quentin was finishing Reservoir Dogs. The last place it showed was uh, Toronto and we were there. That was the second festival we were in. And when I met and Robert, not a person with a lot of friends, mm -hmm. you know, he's shy. So he just works on his thing, very obsessive. And he has 10 siblings, you know, I mean, I understand, you know, my, you know, you become friends with your, the ones in your house, you know, you don't have time for anything else. <laughs> so, um, you know, you don't have time to go party. You don't have, you don't have money like that. You know, <laughs> so, so a, a, when I met Quentin, I was like, oh, like I felt this immediate, like, oh, I found a friend for Robert. <laughs> you know, 
I swear to you, in the lobby of the Toronto hotel where we were staying, and I looked at him because somebody introduced him to me. I may have been Robert Newman, and I said, "I want you know." It was oh my gosh, blah, 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 you know. And I was like, "I want you to meet Robert. I want you to meet my husband." And he was like, "Let's go immediately! Like, let's go!" And I was like, "Okay." So I took him up to our room and I opened the door. I said, Robert, I have somebody for you to meet. It was like magic. Wow. It was magic to find this. Brothers, yeah, brothers, brothers. Brother. And they've been that since, you know? Yeah. They found each other and they could understand each other so well. You know, the same thing with Guillermo. There's just been certain people that Robert has done this with, you know, like very, you know. Oh, I clicked in with you know yeah. and it's beautiful because uh you know it's 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 not easy in this business a bunch of fancy ones you know um <laughs> you know, it's not we don't live in la we never wanted to live in la you know right. so it's been a beautiful i mean jim cameron and robert always hit it off like boom you know like very close knit. Wait. so people are like how did alita happen it's like they've been friends for a long time jim right. and robert have been friends for a, just like guillermo del toro and jim cameron you know uh yeah jim is his own kind person you know very close tight-knit people they don't really hang out with a bunch of you know hollywood yeah. types right you know so so yeah so it's beautiful you know it's kind of that. it's kind of like um you know we can smell our own uh when you meet someone yeah. like that it's it's like oh okay i found it look growing up you it's hard to find other filmmakers that you can con or other people that you can connect with at that level uh, and that's why a lot of times when I'm when that I'm level of passion, that the, level pa of the, passion. The, that level of passion, the it, level it, of skill it, and ex it, like yes. all of that kind of because there's a lot of people who might be passionate, but that can actually pull off what you're doing. That's a very that's, small group. Well, even the passion, though, leads to everything to yeah. you doing it. Because, for example, in film school, it was hard for Robert because the <laughs> other people that he was working with to make Bedhead, you know, they oh, I got a party I got to go to, you know, I yeah. got to hurry up. That's right. never going to happen. The negativity is a very interesting thing. It, it was hard for him, you know, um, and he just kind of went, you know what? It's OK. And he did all those films by himself. He didn't really need people to right. work, to do bad heads, you know. So, so, uh, so you know, it, it was yeah, like that. You know? I'm glad I'm glad that we were able to put in the public record the story of Mariachi. <laughs> Because it's been such an urban myth about so many things about mariachi. It's all true, though. And it's and all true. yeah, and it's, it's and it's beautiful. By the way, that with my heart full, I can mm -hmm. tell you. And the writing of the book, I mean, that's his diary. Right. I just yeah. took his diary. He 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 entrusted it to me to edit it a little bit. I was the pre-editor before the editor got it. Um, you know, just I just you know made sure that it made sense. You know, because it's just his stream of consciousness, and I admire that. I don't write. A diary. I don't. A, I don't, a, a journal, journal, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm, not that, I'm, I'm not that person. You know. Yeah, I've stupid. I've tried. I can't journal. I, I, I'm not. I've yeah. tried. I've sat down. I'm like. I can't really do it. Yeah. It's, I can do a grateful list. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I drop off. <laughs> no, I mean. Day either I should. And that book. <laughs> and that book, Rebel Without a Crew, is still to this day. Seminal. It's a seminal book in independent film. Uh, I I've. I remember I was I remember when it came out I was in I was in film school in Orlando. I picked up the book and I read it in one sitting. I just sat there just in awe because you again and for people listening you have to understand in 91 92 I was in when film school I was 94 94 95. I picked up a first mm -hmm. edition. I still have my first edition of of uh, Rebel Without a Crew. And wow. Oh yeah, no, I've no, yeah, no, 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 soy serio, soy serio. Uh, <laughs> and I remember reading it. And for me, people have to understand in the nineties, there wasn't this, it wasn't cool to be the filmmaker just yet. The rock and roll filmmaker, the rock and roll director, which I think Quentin and Robert kind of created that kind of persona because Spielberg had been around and Scorsese and Coppola, but there wasn't the rock and roll kind of like present this kind of person. And so, but there was no information. There was no YouTube. There was barely any making ofs. There was like, you had laser discs with commentaries if you were lucky. There was nothing. That book for me, when I was reading it, it was like a portal into Hollywood, which seemed like a world away. And I was being taken on a journey with a, with a filmmaker, a Latino filmmaker. Like, so you have to understand the power of that for, for a Latino reading it was so influential and so powerful for me. Um, and I have such reverence for that book. 
um, that I always tell people, I wrote a book uh, called Shooting for the Mob about how I almost yeah. made a, I almost made a movie for $20 million movie for the mafia. And I always tell people, Oh my God. Oh yeah. And then I was, and then in many ways, I so, I so I don't know. Wait a minute. So, wait a minute, wait a minute. so then what happened was I, I made this book and then in many ways, because of the mariachi story, a lot of the stuff that happens to me in that book, I got flown out to LA. I met the biggest movie stars. I bet I, I met big power players and I'm like, oh my God, this is my mariachi, but I got this psychotic gangster behind me threatening my life on a daily basis. <laughs> so I always tell people, if you want to read two books in the film business, you read Rebel Without a Crew, and that's the way, that's the positive side of how a career could go. And then you read my book is the opposite side of the coin, where I went into complete depression and almost oh got my myself God. killed. So uh, it's like the complete opposite. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would say that that kind of bookends it. You know? like, <laughs> that book says it like you could go off and have Robert's career or you can go off and like, oh, you almost got killed. Uh, you almost, <laughs> almost did this, almost did that. It was it was a remarkable story. But anyway, um, but yeah. That's but, amazing. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Um, well, don't love that. It must have been hard. <laughs> no, hold on. Okay. No, I mean, it was, it was. No, but you know what? I mean, I think that, uh, that the negativity that came from it was harsh. I will be really honest. Oh, there was God. a lot of yeah, the hater, the hate. Oh God, there were a lot of hurtful things said, and and Robert was really clear. He wouldn't even say it at the same Sundance where the other guys were there, the ones that um, had a thirty-eight thousand dollar movie. Robert said they did the same thing I did. They just made a film print. I didn't. Right. That's what a thirty thousand dollar is. You know. So that's the difference. I, you know, I ended up going and shopping it around and somebody else made a film point for me um, because he was trying to encourage people that, yeah, you could, you don't necessarily have to make the film print, you know? So mm -hmm. think about that. You know, he was already helping people think of it a little different because he was like, I'm not different than this $38,000 movie. He was very clear in the panels. Mm -hmm. It's just that that probably wasn't even filmed at that time, you know, uh, and saved because it, uh, it really, but I just love that people like Kevin Smith saw huh. that and it, I mean, he was like, okay, I got a, I got a store that I work at, a convenience store. I got some friends that are hilarious. You know, like, <laughs> there it is, clerks, you know. I love that. I love that. And it keeps, you know, repeating itself. And, and, and by the way, I don't know if you know this. Uh, Robert, with some of our kids, um, made a film called Red Eleven. Yeah, I'm dying to see it. When is it coming out? I don't know. I have to find out. <laughs> but it is. It is a visual of how to do a $7,000 movie today mm -hmm. with what you have. Right. And exactly the mariachi style, but somebody, he had an actual crew. Film it all Film thing. him doing it. Oh, God, please. Please release this. It, so so it, um, <laughs> Luis Cafese, uh, Luis is uh, Latino also, is the, the, the guy that filmed him doing it. But they were doing it. You know, exactly. The actors themselves were the ones... You know, my son Rebel is in it, and he also is um, the composer of the movie. I paid no money, but now he's composed two other movies. He got paid for it, you know? Nice. So he he made the sacrifice for saying that, because he's a really good composer. He did We Can Be Heroes for Robert, and, you know, he's just a 22-year-old kid, but, man, he really is good. So you... And by the way, and he was buoyed by people like John Debney, who, right. you know, wanted to help him succeed because we have had other people like that their kids have wanted to be filmmakers and we've had them come and be interns with us or work in our movies you know i mean james spader's son sebastian worked with us for a whole year and a half as you know behind the scenes because he loved uh and he had been working since he was he was amazing you, you, you know so, what you know we try to help others you know to for their kids to come in it's and uh, and and that they want something they want to learn from someone else it's what beautiful. i what i found amazing about what about what we've talked about so far and just from what i've studied over the years about what you and robert have done is that you really did pull that curtain back for for a generation uh, of, of filmmakers because there i mean everyone under everyone listen you have to understand man, before before mariachi before what robert and and honestly a lot of that generation you know ed eddie and 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 rick and all those guys um, it was closed. There was the the door was closed. There was no opportunity to do anything, and Robert there was, was not kinda, even like a glimmer of light. Coming nada. In. It was, it was, it was not, one of those like thick blackout curtains. 
curtain. Yeah, you couldn't see. Yeah. It was a curtain, but you thought it was a wall. You know, Correct. It really was a curtain, but not one ounce of light came through it to help you think nothing, you might. Nothing. Might, it, yeah, it, it was all you would see is. I always say like there's there's gods and there's demigods of the film industry and, and you know you would look at Spielberg and you would look at Coppola and Scorsese and and then Hitchcock and and, and, and Lucas uh, and, and Lucas you know, and, uh, and all these all these guys and and they would they just seemed so far away the stories you heard they they were also like you know Stephen had his his mythical urban myth of him jumping off the tray off the off the, the tram and all that stuff uh one day when i get him on the show that's the first question i'm asking him uh i'm like steven please <laughs> is this true i just need to know um but we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show but it, it was so far away and when the the story of mariachi showed up and that's what I love about about one one of the many things I love about Mariachi is it was the first time the making of the film was in the marketing. Prior to that, no one ever led with I made a seven thousand dollar movie. By the way, everyone listening, don't do that anymore. You don't. That's it's don't gone because it. everybody <laughs> can do that now. Stop. Stop. Don't lead that. You're like I shot my movie with an iPhone. Don't care. Is it a good story? But back then, yeah. it was extremely impressive for, for him, for Kevin, for even Rick and all those guys. Uh, it, it was extremely impressive. Nicolás López. Nicolás no. López from Chile, you know. He, um, he came with his little first film. And, uh, and I love that he said, he came all the way from Chile, wrote me a hilarious letter, you know. Inspired, there's a character in, in Promedio Rojo called Robert Rodriguez. Robert, <laughs> the lead character is named Robert Rodriguez. Uh -huh. And he loves to draw and all this stuff. And uh, <laughs> and he looked around at the troublemaker at our studios and said, and I love this. He said, I'm going back to Chile to do this. Oh. And he did. And he has, you know. And, and that's built. beautiful, you know. When somebody gets inspired like that. Uh, I just heard while I was doing this movie about... Um, a, a, another filmmaker um, that literally said, you told me to go home and, and create this at home. Um, Sterling, Sterling Harjo, mm -hmm. the, the, the Native American filmmaker. Um, he, you know, he was like, I'm going to move to Austin. And I was like, and, and he told somebody that re said to me that I was the inspiration because I said, no, Sterling, go do it where you're from. That's what it's about in with your people with everything and now he's working with taika watiti in reservation dogs nice that's pretty awesome that's it's amazing really awesome, you know and i love hearing stories of you said a little something that planted a seed that now is giving you know it's growing and really going out there and uh so sterling is, is doing it in oklahoma man and now they have 35 percent tax rebates and that's amazing pretty amazing that's so, amazing it is amazing you know so in oklahoma <laughs> in oklahoma no no less oklahoma you know so, so very cool you know so as a so as a producer all right so you go through the mariachi and and the whole world win and they go okay robert we want you to make another movie and it's desperado and they give him more money than Kind of. Well, no, no, no. Actually, it was Road Racers. The so Road Racers no, no, no. first. Yeah, no, I know about Road Racers, but it was like, they, they, once they won the Audience Award, they were so confused as to what they wanted. Really? They didn't know if they wanted a sequel or if they wanted to a remake it, a reshoot, redoing of it. They, it was so confusing because it won the Audience Award. That's where it got confused. At Sundance, yeah. Sundance. Because before it was like, we'll just remake it. You know, but then, but they're like, wait a minute, yeah, people actually like, like the audience award. People, people are like see this. People like this movie. <laughs> so now what? <laughs> mm, you know, so it was I, a mess actually. It was oh my god. So no, a you good know, mess. A good mess. Right. Originally, a mess. it was a blessing of a mess because originally it was not supposed to be released mm -hmm. widely. It was mm -hmm. like okay, so we'll see that. Yeah, we'll do this. We'll do that. But then, cool. Interesting, cool. All right, he's got talent. Let's see what we can do. But now, like, wait a minute, one. Oh my God, we're gonna have to put this out there. Like, what do we and want? By now? the way, I mean, people are like, oh, he just was media trained and he was able. To media trained, get media trained. Let me tell you, but let me tell you that that's not true because right. even in Telluride, you know, Telluride is not a competitive film festival. That was our first film festival, mm -hmm. and you know, we had the blessing of somebody like Chuck Jones, you know, from Bugs Bunny fame. Yeah, you know, yeah, Wiley Coyote fame. Yeah. 
who has a house in Telluride. And uh, he had come to UT when Robert was a cartoonist. And we love Chuck Amuck, his I book. Mean, so he yeah, signed yeah. the book for us and everything. And Robert always said that Mariachi was kind of like a cartoon movie. You could turn off the volume and you knew exactly what was going on. And, and that his hero was Chuck Jones. And this man showed up at a screening. We ended up with five screenings in, uh, in Telluride, which is pretty Un- unheard of. Only, yeah. Like huge films get five. Sure, screenings, sure, you know? sure. Um, you know, uh, movies that have done extremely well, but everybody wanted to see it because Robert got up there and could explain what he did. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, so it's really interesting. So it's not, you know, oh, he got media trained between, you know, but for Sundance. No, he went to Toronto. He did the same thing. He, he had already been doing it, but he already knew what was important. Robert always knows how to, when you give him a microphone, he knows, when you interview him, he knows how to hit. It's just natural with it. You know, it really is. Yeah, and, and the thing. you watch any interview. And I want I want everybody listening to understand that there were so many people, and I, I was there, I, I wasn't there with you guys, but I saw it from a distance, how many people tried to tear him down. How many people tried to, to break him down, whether for whatever reason there was so much jealousy. Oh my God, I can't even imagine the amount of jealousy. Even jealousy from like... A lot it, of it. I kept a lot of it from him because me being... People didn't know my face. Right. I would hear these, you know? Right. For example... Somebody said, how dare they give him, you know, go from the 7000 to the $30 million talking. Another filmmaker that had been at Sundance, $30 million for Desperado after it's Desperado thir- came 30, out. And I, 30 million. And I went, uh, no, it's not. I mean, it sounds like a lot, $7 million, but we had full actors, full everything. You know, oh, like, no, no, no. It wasn't a lot. It, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't a lot. So, and by the way, he'd done a $1 million movie called Road Racers in the meantime. Mm-hmm. He did, as Roger Ebert always said. The best room out of four rooms. They all had the same amount of money. They all had. I, and I Robert. Did like, yeah, and by I the way, like. and that four rooms is the seat of Spy Kids. Yeah. When he saw it is. those people, yeah. you know, it was like, what are these people? Hmm. And then he thought, keep your mouth shut. Don't even say that word. Say it to no one. Keep that seed. Start writing it. Start doing it. So when Bob needed somebody to do the faculty, which was a Kevin Williamson script he had overpaid a lot of money for. Robert was like, okay, but you can't tell anyone this name. And so we got a deal where we could do Spy Kids and we could do other things. So, but, you know, it's like, okay, you do this for me, I'll give you five picture deals, you know? Cause already, you know, we had done Dust Till Dawn, you know, okay, so now you want us to do the faculty. Okay, we'll do that. You know, you paid a lot of money for that and nobody really wants to direct this thing. And we had fun with it. We had a blast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it, but it helped us. That's when we began to work in Austin with our crew, you know? And you, in the family um, that you were building, yeah, the family. In the, it, it, yeah. Literally with the people that we've created as a film family here. So all of that, uh, the faculty was a really important thing for us to do to come home. We always kept our apartment here in Austin. It was just that, you know, dust, they, they didn't let us edit Desperado here. So in Austin, I'm in Austin right, right now. Um, it, but uh, so he had to go uh, to L.A. to edit it. In the meantime, dust still don't happen. So while we were there... We would come home and we had our stuff here. So, um, and but yeah, so that's how that happened. That's a progression of things. So, with, people are like, How did he get all that? And how did he, you know, it can't, it, again, oh my god, it was so much yeah. hate, so much hate. I just I remember so many filmmakers, Activity and hate. It's sad. It was, and by the way, so we quietly, and by the way, we also got it from the Latinos, man. Oh, no, we I know, oh, everybody, the Latinos. It was pretty. It was pretty astounding, you know, when your own people are like, you know, crabs in a bucket, man. <laughs> no, it's crabs. It's crap. It was because and by look- the way, our leaving, leaving, being at home is part of the reason that we just got really out of the way of everybody and just made our thing happen here, including the studios, little by little. You know, the airport closed. I lobbied to get for a short time to film Spy Kids One, you know, mm-hmm. and then lobbied for keep it for longer then lobbied to get the big deal that we got to be able to keep it and and put money into it so we've invested a lot in ourselves and and just quietly got people to shut up so and then whenever anybody of those people that were so negative wanted to glom on to anything we just kind of went well we're okay here we really yeah, I don't, don't want to bring that I don't think you guys you know? would have been able to do what you did in, in LA there's just no, no way no, there's just no, no way there's no, no way the amount 
yeah, because you, when you when you're in a place where people are, we just kept doing our thing. We just kept doing our thing, and Bob was not in L.A. Bob Weinstein, that who that we worked for Bob. You know, that's who mm. we ended up doing the rest of the movies for a long time for. And it was wonderful because I love Bob. I love Bob. Bob Weinstein is, you know, he's, Harvey is a, you know, whatever, you know. But Bob mm. Weinstein was always a fair and very, I, I just called Bob. I never had to call anybody else. It was just Bob. Right. Right. You know, and so I got to the, you know, the buck stops here kind of box, you know, so, uh, and uh, so, yeah. So as a producer, when you were working on Desperado, this is your first big, you know, you got seven million. I'm assuming you're not the only producer, obviously, on that project. But no, no, by the way, I was just starting. They, like nobody. So I, yeah. I took no money. I was the wife. You know, like people are like the wife. Of, oh, God, <laughs> oh, God. I guess if we I get Robert, that. we got to take that. Yeah. By the way. No. So I looked at them. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll be the producer intern that takes no money and I will work from beginning to end because I do want to learn. So, you know, people like uh, Tony Mark, who was our, our UPM, really admired that because I busted, I mean, I busted a move. The people, my the other line producer from Mexico, you know, they're still dear, dear friends, you know, because I busted a move and I worked all through post-production that thing wow. and learned so much. I'm a, I'm a studious human being. You give me something to learn, I want to learn, mm -hmm, damn it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whatever it takes, you know. And, uh, and, you know, so it didn't take anything from the movie and I just was... You know, I was able to really navigate those things because nobody could say that I was being paid. You know, right. I did it out of my heart. You know, so um, and I'm glad it's that not like Robert was make, it's not like Robert was making a ton of money at that point either. You know, that was oh, his no. first film. That was his first look film for Columbia Pictures. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, Meh, you know. Oh yeah, like he got a fat million, check. Certainly wasn't going to him. We put <laughs> it all on the screen. I mean, we. And by the way, and it was beautiful to be able to go back to Ciudad Acuña where we shot a mariachi. Yeah. And actually, pay people. You know, right. that's where we chose to shoot it there. To go back and 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 really pay people because mariachi there was no money seven thousand dollars. What can you pay? Right. Um. So so it's a beautiful way to bless a place that had been a blessing already to us. You mm -hmm. know. And you had and that to come and, back, you know. And you had that, and you had that young, uh, young un, uh, two, two uh, unknowns uh, here in the states, Mr. Antonio Banderas and Miss Salma Hayek, uh, yeah, and Mr. Danny Trejo, for that matter. Which, by the way, everybody wanted Antonio. Salma, it was hard. Oh, oh no! It was the first. It was a female, first female a, lead. Robert had done road racers with her to give her one screen title on a movie in the United States that was for Showtime, and that was strategic, you know. Mm -hmm. And he put her in. There was actually in that movie is David Arquette. Yeah. And it's Tama, and it's uh, John Hawks. One of yeah. John Hawks first. I mean, he's such an incredible actor. Oh, oh John's well, amazing. And uh, and David, it was really his first uh, real lead. You know, like yeah. three of them leading, and uh, and he, a million bucks. And the thing is, the interesting. So this is what sold Columbia Pictures finally, because Robert wrote thirteen versions of the script. They kept rewrites and more rewrites and more rewrites while he's doing Road Racers. Well, when he came in, it was 10 films for um, a Rebel Highway series. That was yeah, in yeah. For right, right, right. And it was, I mean, John Milius was one of the directors. I mean, big time directors were doing this. And somebody fell out and they needed, Wes Craven was doing one. I mean, people like that, you know, B and Robert was like, oh my God, Wes Craven. And the reason why Robert did it is because Deborah Hill was producing. <laughs> and Deborah Hill, John Carpenter's producer. <clears throat> sure. And so, by the way, she became one of my big mentors even before I did Desperado. I was able to take classes at UCLA Extension because she called in favors for me to go into the higher level classes. And she let me sit, not in Robert's part of the film, but in the other films because I had nothing to do with those. And I was able to sit in budget meetings. So, you know, I got a lot out of that, you know, myself. Wow. And uh, so it was a real blessing just to be humble. And somebody say, what do you, when another woman says to you, what do you want to do? Amy Pascal pulled me into the office one day. I was just Robert's wife, you know, like, you know, right. and she pulled me into her office. She was not president back then. She was one of the executives. What do you, I want to, I want to get to know you. Tell me what you want to do. I mean, how beautiful. That's amazing. You know, these women, uh, unreal. <clears throat> and so I've been blessed with having really amazing mentors that took me seriously but also lovingly you know and uh so so that's the reason and sama was able to get in because of that movie but also because robert really really leaned in to get her to be the actress that he because that's what he wanted he wanted sama there was no option and i think there it was, was a 
there was a, even a, a screen test, you know, and, and Robert just literally, um, he, he coached Salma. <laughs> yeah, he coached, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that yeah. she would get it, you know, because he was like, hell no, that's what I want. You're not going to give me some non-Latina, because there were some in the bunch that were non-Latinas. Sure. That were screen testing, you know. So, you know, Robert's like, no. You know, this is who I want. This is the star that I'm going to put in my movie. This is the person. She has everything that I need for this movie, and 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 she's going to be a huge star. Oh, actually. and the and the chemistry and so the chemistry. You, you know, there and, is history. You know? uh, yeah, and as we're speaking yeah. right now, uh, Marvel Studios, The Eternals is is opening, oh, and God, she's so and she's one of the stars she of. Uh, she, she looks, looks amazing. amazing in that. I'm so proud of her. I, she, you know, she's done okay. She's done okay. She's done okay for herself. It's beautiful. No, and she's such a dear, dear, dear sister in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, just we um we've had a great relationship throughout and um, respect I read, and love. I read you somewhere. Know. I read somewhere that Salma called you like the best kept secret of Troublemaker. Like <laughs> it was a very yeah like a like a really best kept secret of Troublemaker. She, she knows. <laughs> anyway, because it's not weird what I do. You know. As a producer. So what is so honest. what so what is a producer? What is the definition of a producer for you? A producer is a person that, you know, in general, you know, gets a story, finds a book or a, you know an article, <laughs> and puts together the development to create that script. And the filmmaker, <coughs> that's a typical producer. The money, sure, you know, brings in whoever the studio. Uh, you bring in, you start creating the 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 creative group that will decide who the actors are Are you trusting who what the the director that you choose or if it's a writer director that wrote the script and all that stuff that's what i produce and then you start you know in my case i worked very closely with my line producer upm a man named bill scott to create the budget and to create you know we literally that's what we did here starting with the faculty and we did it for 17 films so um you just create all the synergy that has to happen, then you begin to choose the crew members, you know, um, and the, the teams that are going to come in. And like I said, all that happens in pre-production. You're, you're making it all work so that it is, you have a schedule that matches what your budget, that, you know, that you know that you're going to shoot where are the locations. So you, you create all of those things along with the director um, and, you know, with your, you know, with your first AD and, you know, you, you work in teams, you know, that's what a producer does. And then um, you, you know, make sure that the everyday running of the movie as it's going and you fix or and by the way, you make the deals with the actors, you um, mm. so you're dealing with the agents and then making sure the actors arrive and everything that's contractually theirs is there and, you mm -hmm. know, and, and happens and all of the fun, the fun stuff. And, you know, and you also if you're a good producer, in my opinion, you make sure that they all feel you know, safe and warm and cozy, you know, in a way. <laughs> yeah. um, like mother, like a mother, like almost a mother hen in, 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 in way. many ways, yeah, in, in a way. Yeah. And in some ways, you're also the principal. Yeah, you know? <laughs> very so, much so. Toro came in immediately when we were doing Sin City and he comes in and it's when he has the, the gash here. So it's yeah. like, you know, he's like all bloody. Yeah. Like, so is this the principal's office? <laughs> am, I, am I in trouble? It the, yes, it is. But it depends if you've been not behaved or not how what, what how you how we deal with you I said, <laughs> how i deal with you he was so great i love benicio he's so funny oh my god hilarious so by the way what a gentle by the way he was raised by his mama right let me tell you that guy yeah. like had manners out the wazoo for women really but just in general you know like people yeah he's just like you know very attentive you know very latino that way people nice. don't know that about benicio <laughs> yes, he's he and I'm like him. noticing. Hmm, look at that guy. And nobody else got up but him. When an actress came in, we were all at the pool. He noticed when she came in, not because he, of any other reason than a gentleman, you know. And he found a chair, had a chair for that person, made sure that he didn't just sit around and keep chatting, you know. So uh, for that actress, because she was just arriving into the pool, um, we were having a little party here at the house, and I was like, "I'm watching you, Anisia. I'm watching. Yeah, that's good." <laughs> Brownie points without the wazoo, my man. So, uh, so anyway, so so at the same time for me, like I told you from the beginning, there was a way bigger, um, way bigger call mm. for me, mm -hmm. and it has to do with building something. It has to be with do with building. Even if I've never worked with a crew, how do you 
to help everything work? How do you become fluid or have the assistance so that you you foresee situations, you know? Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> going to happen or you see it. Um, you know, m most actors are, in, you know, like incredible. I've had very few that didn't feel the love that we create with the with the family we created in Austin with our crew and uh and it's a it's a joy for anyone to come into that group and and be received and then become part of the family if you had never worked with us um and uh and enjoy that it's a really beautiful um way of working you know and I couldn't again couldn't have done that in LA no way we wouldn't have never had our own stages you know they're just hangers it, nothing magical, just <laughs> dumb boxes. That's all stages are. But to create a real place that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, you, you're going to be something happens. Somebody cares in your family, in your yeah. life, in you know, in real life, you know. Like real life always intersects <laughs> our world of madness, you know. Yeah. And uh, I've had situations. Somebody whose daughter, all of a sudden, a big big crew member, the higher up echelons, overnight, all of a sudden, has is in a in a coma because type one diabetic and didn't nobody knew. A nine year old, you know, things like that have happened during my movies, and to not be able to cover for that person, so that their real life can be truly dealt with and we create a, a, a bridge for that person you know right, right. it happens all, everybody we all are going through things you know oh and, and if you don't have yeah. and if you don't have those eyes and that heart yeah you can make movies but you also don't you know i just i just finished a movie on friday right friday. i don't know if i told you mm -hmm. Friday, it's not Saturday. Saturday, actually, Sunday at midnight. Um, it's at one o'clock in the morning. Um, and I never worked with this crew mm -hmm. uh, in Oklahoma. They're mostly Oklahomans. And, but it's a director I've been working with for a long time who is a dear Lance Larson writer, director, and a couple of other people that I've known for 20 years. Two of them were my rigging grips of the faculty and in Spy Kids. And now all three were producers with me oh, and wow. another producer named Tara Pirnia. But three, the three of them, one of them had been a first AD in a few movies for me, but he was a rigging grip 23 years ago. Another one is a big time DP. He just finished Crater, but he had been a rigging grip back then and went to UT. And the other one, Lance, the writer director, and uh, that the DP had gone to UT together. Right. So it's these three beautiful humans that I have been around for many years. And then to be able to produce this with them and then to to let them do their job too, you know, um, of being, but Bobby Bastarash, who's, he's Bob Bastarash, producer. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby is the, the, the first AD guy right. that was back then. But now he was able to really be on set and I knew that this set was taken care of. But, you know, we would, you know, we had planned everything so that he could be the producer there with his two buddies. It was their dream to do this together. But you know, the interesting thing is, um, you know, it, it's hard. It's hot, 99 degrees, and it was really cold one day. It was, yeah, you were in West Texas in the middle right. of dust, blah, you know, a lot of stuff. And to be able to be so fluid as to make sure that you could take care of their wants, and it was only a 40 something people crew and cast. Wow. And for me, a movie, making a movie is like going to summer camp. And going to war. Oh God, you know? that's a, that's um, that. Hold on, stop. I have to stop there a second. That is the most perfect definition of going to a movie ever because it is a summer camp, but it is war at the exact same time. What a wonderful quote! War. Oh, it's war. Oh, you know? oh. And and my job, I see my mission, my job as a producer, is to make it more summer camp than war. Mm. And that's that's why. That so and... whatever it takes, whatever it takes, the fluidity of that. I mean, for example, we lost our caterers um, when we were going down to West Texas for reasons, you know, uh, it, it, they were they were great, but they couldn't come down to West Texas. So the uh, Tara Pernia and I decided 
you know, we had to feed people a second meal. We're in the middle of nowhere in West Texas. I mean, like no cell reception, nothing. So we decided, you know what? We'll take care of the breakfast part of it, get tacos and whatever from the businesses there. And you and I do the second meal because we have to provide a second meal for everyone before they go to bed, you know. Right. And came all the way to us. We plotted it out. So for six days, she and I cooked a second meal, a proper second meal for our crew oh that was God. delicious. Mm. Nutritious. Yeah. Light yet nutritious. And you know what? They felt so loved by what we did. So we would do everything we needed to do producer-wise, and then we'd jump in the afternoon to create that second meal and serve, serve something, you know, that was that was uh, that helped them, you know. And they would, and when you, as a producer and as a filmmaker in general, when when the crew sees that, they will go down the the, the alley of hell for you. They will walk right into it with you, because you don't. I've look. I've been on a thousand sets. That doesn't happen often. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it does not. You don't you don't get to work with people like that often. And that's why when people do work with people like that, they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to let you go. Oh, we're going to work. That's why Clint Eastwood has the same team for the last 40 years. Like and Ron Howard Absolutely. doesn't do a movie without his first AD. Like and he waits for his first AD to be available and things like that, because when you grab on. Absolutely. Yeah. When you grab onto it. Family. It's a family you begin to create. And by the way, just because I had never worked with him doesn't mean that I'm not going to be that same person right you know uh and and be uh, present for them and and by the way it it was not an easy shoot but even mm -hmm. around it was the first time these guys they had just done a huge martin scorsese movie there in oklahoma mm -hmm. uh the flower moon something like yeah, that. yeah they're, they're posting it now yeah. yeah yeah exactly and uh he um so you know uh so big lots of crafty lots of everything oh no no no, of no, no, no. Yeah, yeah of course of course you name yeah. it it's yeah, big, yeah, yeah. right and this was a little movie. And so the ones that did decide to come play with us, I wanted to make sure that it was as good in other ways. Sure. In the independent, to set a standard for what an independent film should be. Yeah. Uh, for them. And that uh, they choose carefully in their lives, you know, if they want to continue in, in movies to, to, by the way, it's hard. It's not, it's, a, it's hard. Making movies is hard. It's not easy. Never it's is, not, no matter what. But, but if, never. by the way, and it was beautiful because Tara Pirnia, the other producer, that uh, she had interviewed me in Spike It's One, and that's what inspired her to want to be a producer. She was a, a journalist, and uh, uh, so it's kind of beautiful, you know, because I got to take her by the arm, and she's a badass producer. She's worked for BBC. She lived in London, and you know, did mm -hmm. all those royal, you know, documentaries and all that mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was like, okay, in this one, <laughs> we're going to be. <laughs> this is what we're doing. And she goes, okay, so we can't have any ego. I said, no. Actually, it's the opposite. I said, very healthy ego. Because nothing we do, even if it's picking up trash, doing whatever we do, doesn't take away from us and who we are as producers. It's actually seen as a higher calling in some ways. Because most producers won't do this. So all of a sudden, you are creating a situation in which people go, you know what? If someday I'm a producer, I want to be like that producer versus that producer. And I hope everyone listening takes this, everything that you're saying, Elizabeth, to heart because uh, these are the kind of words that I, this is one of the reasons why I do the show, is to get this kind of information out into the world that is not something you hear often. The things that you're saying are things we want to happen on a set, want people to act like, but often is never really, like I said, and you've been around. I've been around. You don't see it often. You've created your own world and you've had the privilege of being able to do that. And I think you you and Robert both understand the privilege that you have in the, that the universe has given you. And you've taken that and really done something pretty magical with it. I'll, I'll tell you one of the things I, I just recently moved to Austin and I, I you did I, I'm yes you're living here I live here no. I live in Austin you're kidding me I live in Austin oh, yes. yes I moved. We have to can we get to hang out? We get. We should definitely I hang out. I'd love to meet your wife and your dog. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> oh but God, the reason the reason I brought that up is because I moved from Miami to LA, because it was LA. What you do? You have to do. do. I was there. I was there 13 years. I met our our, our common friend Straw there uh, two, a month after I got there, and I've, I haven't been able to get rid of him since. I've tried many times. <laughs> I can't get rid of him. 
He's like a dirty Straw penny. Awesome. He, he's, awesome, he's like a dirty penny. Wait, he just keeps going. Straw Wiseman is, he's a patron saint of filmmakers. He really is. No, 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 he no. Really he's and, and, and <laughs> Straw, be one of those candles with a straws. Oh my God, that would be amazing. I should get that for his birthday. Oh my God, that would be amazing. Uh, no, Straw, <laughs> Straw has been on the show. I had him on the show uh, years ago uh, to talk about what it's like to do what he does. Straw is a whole other conversation. But, um, but I was there for 13 years. And I finally got to the point where people were like, why did you move to Austin? Why did you leave L.A.? Like the dream is to be in L.A. and, and to, to do all that stuff. And I said to, I said to everybody, I go, I, I reached the limits of what I could do in L.A. Not in the business, but what I wanted to do for my family or what I wanted to do for my company. Just like you guys couldn't have built Troublemaker in L.A., I can't build what I'm building with Indie Film Hustle and everything. I couldn't take it to the next level there so here there's there's nothing but land <laughs> i just realized there's like the freaking there's nothing but land out here like i'm so i'm driving around like oh my god like i because i what lived in Bur- I, I lived in burbank so i lived in burbank and well, burbank so it was all soft and concrete I, I, I mean it was just like where houses were on top of each other and i love don't get me wrong i love la i love what it did no, no i love by the way i love going to la don't i love la i out. love la not cra- people that I love there. And, uh, it's yeah, amazing. Absolutely. It's amazing. But but like, you know, I was right down the street from Warner Brothers and I found out that my house actually was originally on the Warner Brothers ranch studio set and they picked it up in the 30s and moved it to where it sat. I, oh, that's crazy. I, I was like, like, what is going on? But you drive around LA, there's just there's no there's not there's no land. I mean, you got to go far out before you start seeing real land. And here, the second I got here, I was just like, oh, my God, there's nothing. Even in, I mean, I mean, obviously, in the city, it's a city. But like it. Yeah, the city's a city. Yeah. Five, but five or ten. By the way, I live out in Spicewood. I've <laughs> been the, here 20. Does the, does the smoke from Willie's. 28 years. Does so. the smoke from Willie's house come over and you get a contact high or no? <laughs> I can go visit him. <laughs> But anyway, but that was one of the reasons I moved here. And, and and a lot of people have to understand that as you get older, you realize that there's things that what's important to you in life, you know, and where do you want to go? And, and and it's a lesson for filmmakers to do as well, because a lot of filmmakers think that you could only make it in L.A. And that's not true. I can't, do. Do I think that filmmakers should go to L.A. for a, a short upon a time? You can, it, the, If you can get the experience that you get in L.A., I learned more in one year in L.A., working with straw <laughs> then I did five years in Miami and there's because it's just so much stuff going on there but at a certain point you just go hmm where, where, where do I go what do I got to do where, where, where are the where are the openings to 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 grow to to uh, to expand to to allow the next set, stage because you go in stages you know yes I'll tell you um, a I'm at a place right now where I am extremely picky what I do and who I do it with, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I know the feeling. <laughs> you know, it, it's especially things that I've been working on for a while, this particular movie, um, it's called Deadland. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, Lance and I have known each other. Like I said, I've known these guys so long. Love them. They're good people. They've developed their talents to a point that Man, they they can ask for money, whatever money. Uh, Lance has been an editor for a long time for Disney, for people like that, you know, like big studios. And uh, but they're all from around here, you know. Uh, they went to UT, and um, and I've known them so long, and they've always proven to be uh, these incredible, hardworking, talented humans that love mm-hmm. film, that love movies, love storytelling, great writers. Lance nice. and Jazz Shelton, the DP, wrote the script with a couple other people, David Elliott, uh, people like that. So, so you know, um, so to be able to now work, and by the way, the movie is like seventy-five percent Latinos. Wow! Um, because it was written, it's a beautiful story of. Um, it's not about. By the way, when Lance said it, it was a movie, it's a border movie. I was like, I don't do border movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I'm good. I'm Elizabeth, good. Elizabeth, you know me. It's not really a border movie. It takes place in the border. Okay, I said I said it wrongly. I said, "Okay, Lance," because I love Lance Larson. He's sure, 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 really sure, sure. A truly, um, 
spiritual open human that I loved working with. Just the crew, just adore he and jazz. I mean, they just yeah, yeah, yeah. The spirit in that set was so cool, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, uh, but it's just um, how you know you you think your personal history is a certain. You have a mythology. We're talking about mythology about your family and what it is and and what you think it is and the things you've written in, into it yourself from things you heard as a kid, you know, and then there's the mystery part of it. You, you know, there's certain things that nobody talks about and you're like trying to figure it out, you right. know, things like that. So, and it's a movie kind of like that, you know, that That's has awesome. to do with a, a, a guy that thinks his father never showed up for him. He's a border patrol guy. And yet the story is not that simple and, and, and uh, so the beautiful in development of what goes about because he's about to have a baby, you know, so that he can be more of a complete man is, is the story of this movie. But we had um, uh, Roberto Urbina and Juliet nice. Restrepo. Both of them are Colombians. Nice. Um, we had Manuel Uriza, who is nice. Mexican and a Mexican-American, but he's amazing. And then we had Julio Cedillo. Uh, who's been in a ton of stuff. Julio is amazing. Mm-hmm. And also Luis Chavez, that is this uh, wonderful young man. I don't know if you remember in, um, in uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, Ocean's 13. Mm-hmm. He's the guy in the truck with Casey Affleck. He's the Mexican <laughs> guy. He, he, that's, that's Luis. Oh, my but God. Luis is this incredible. Uh, he comes from, from, uh, from um, Michoacan. Mm-hmm. Uh, indigenous, completely nice. indigenous. Wow. Uh, from a little, basically, Adobe. Um, wow. And just to hear, we drove together from West Texas, and I said, I want you to tell me, just like your first question, I want you to tell me What's your... how it all started. What was the seed? Oh my God. What a trip. That's we, amazing. We took across the Texas landscape, you know, hearing this amazing story of how he got where he was, you know, and uh, so much of it. You know, the steps sometimes of what we made happen or somebody like Ricardo Montalban oh. leaving, you know, making a foundation yeah. um, to create a space for Latinos to, to train in, you know, acting and in film and things, Ricardo, you know. Man. Oh. It's incredible, you know. It's 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 all el daños, you know, little little stepping stones and that's, and that, that people follow. Yeah, and and and, the, and that's the thing that people also listening have to understand that it, it, you you guys didn't do what you did like in, in a year, <laughs> like it took oh, it step took by step, step by step, piece by piece, patient by patience, and when opportunities present themselves, you take advantage of the opportunities and you keep moving forward and you just and you keep going down and you don't let the haters in, and that was one of the things I admired from a distance about what you and Robert were doing because you just kept doing you. And you're like, you know what? The hell with everybody. We're going to set up in Austin. You know, we're going to build up our own thing here. We're going to keep our doing our thing here. And we're just going to keep going forward. And I don't care what anybody else says. And that is something that, because, I mean, the amount of pressure that that you guys have been under, oh, and not just with mariachi, it's continued and still probably continues continue. to this it day. It always has continued. Yeah, yeah. it has. Yeah. It always is like. Because, by the way, sometimes Robert doesn't choose to do Latino centered films, you know, yeah. he's done. I mean, but Battle, the way, with Alita, Alita, yeah. the lead was a Latina girl. Of course know, it was. Yeah. And there was a couple other Latinos was, in there. Of course, of course it was. And, a couple and other by Latinos. the way, Michelle Rodriguez plays a huge part, but people are like, it's, you know? it's, 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 it drives it like that. Me. But I, mean, <sighs> I didn't produce Alita, but John Landau came and just loved working with our family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through, you know, that was beautiful for me because I know that John understands. That yeah. that wasn't built overnight either, you know. Oh no! And, and that uh, love he found in a tiny state, because by the way, our Green King Queen stage is like nine thousand square feet. It's not big, yet mm-hmm. we were able to shoot everything and create that back lot. On That's insane. The, we're in this, you know, what used to be airport hangars, you know. Right. It no, and and and, and working and and I've heard stories of, of Jim and Robert working together and uh, you know just talking together about stuff and when I heard that this movie was going to come out I was like that makes all the sense in the world because if not Jim is never going to make it because he's in Avatar world <laughs> he's busy he's so I, I, this is my joke he's like you know well he has Avatar 2 3, three four, 4 and he has F- Titanic 2 and there we go there's going to be a Titanic 2 no <laughs> is that an insight is that a scoop no uh... is that a scoop <laughs> No. It's called Titanic 2 Jack's back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jack somehow found something to float on. 
amazing. <laughs> but yeah, so so you know, it, it, there's been that friendship for a long time, you know, between those two, and and a beautiful one, you know, between Robert and you know Jim took him under his wing in some ways, you know, and and oh, yeah. and, and, and encouraged him. Go. When did they meet? When did they your... meet? When did they meet? Long. I mean, long. Like this mariachi time, first... desperado times. It, we probably met him. Robert got to spend time with him. Uh, what was the name of that movie when Robert really got to hang out a little bit Spy with him? Kids. I was so excited. Was Way Spy? back. I mean, oh. it was it, after Desperado. I would say after oh, Desperado. So it's, oh, so it's around there. We were living in L.A. Yeah. Um, uh, what was the? It was ah, it was with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the one with that Jamie oh. Lee Curtis. What's the name? True, yeah, True Lies. Uh, true Lies. 94. True Lies. Around there, exactly. When we were living in LA, had to live in LA. So right. he got to hang out. We went to the premiere, um, oh. you know, and and uh, <laughs> and he was just, you know, and he was and even in '94. Jim was Jim, like <laughs> oh, Jim was Jim. Uh, Jim. By the way, I, you know, this is one of the things people blah blah blah. Jim Cameron and you know, my my oldest son is the one that pointed this out to me a while back, and this continues. He goes, "Mom, what other filmmaker do you know?" We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. No. That has never in his life met a flop. Ever. Like Amen. Ever. Amen. Ever. Amen. Ever. Like never had a movie that didn't perform and made money. And it's like Jim Cameron's the only one I know. And, you know? and at, a, at a high level. And people a, can say a lot of stuff, you know. <laughs> no, and I always tell people, and I always, I loved, and I also defend Jim, not that he needs my defense, but anytime, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always out there. I'm I like, love him. I know Jim, Jim is, Jim is one of, one of the, on, on the Mount Rushmore of, of filmmakers for me. me. Absolutely. Jim, so yes. Jim, and, and people, because he's such an underrated writer. And he's such an underrated, uh, you know, a lot of times people like, because everyone's like, oh, he's directing, he's very direct. I'm like, you, you read Aliens. Are you kidding me? Read, read wait, the, the abyss. Read, read Alita, what he'd already done. Ah. The character, by the way, the character, Robert is the one that told me, he said, Elizabeth, the character, I've learned so much just receiving this treasure to direct because it taught me the character break. I mean, he knows who these people are, each one of them. That's He's amazing. fleshed them fully out, you know, and he said, it is such an incredible joy and entrustment that he has given me to do this you know and i hope we get to you know that that the studio gets to make a second one oh no has to one because it's a three-part yeah three i i'm i'm praying I'm really hoping for that because they're incredible stories you know that no, uh, truly i mean the father-daughter story is just no, no, it's, 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 it's it, and it was beautifully shot and, and what robert did was amazing with it but what i always also say with jim i go who else what other filmmaker on the planet today can walk into Fox Studios and goes, listen, I've got an idea. It's about a bunch of blue people. It's based on no IP. Uh, I, there's a new technology that I'm going to develop. I'm going to need 200 million to develop the technology. Uh, it's going to take me <laughs> just, to, just to see if we can make it happen. Then there's going to be three years, two, three years of me, you know, messing around with that, twiddling around with that. Then I'll probably need a probably a couple hundred million more to finish it all up. <laughs> And and we're gonna do all that, and it's gonna be probably about a good five six years uh, before you see anything. I challenge any who, who what, n not any of the other gods that we've talked about filmmaking gods like Nat Scorsese, Nat Spielberg. No one else has that. There's nobody else on the planet that can do that. Take my every day. I take my hat off to them. Got, I really do. It's, it's astounding. You know? So I'm gonna ask. And you I love the relationship with his brother to find. Yeah, that synergy of, you know, creating. I mean, we were able to do a 3D movie because of what they had done. Yeah. And when we did Shark Boy Lava Girl uh, 3D. I love that movie. It came from, you know, and the Spy Kids 3D. It came from the rig they had invented, you know, and they had created. So <laughs> it's such an insanity. It's so, easy. so much. I mean, imagine. I mean, he's creating equipment, you know, like. For this he's set. like. He's like in creating equipment. It's like it's a, it's an insane. It's unbelievable. No, no. It's... Designing a, a little a little <laughs> submarine that can go down to the freaking Titanic. I mean, that's to shoot. That's some high level stuff. But that's, that's high level. That's people from another planet. I no, mean, and that's, the, that's how I. You know, he and right. his brother. And, yeah. I, and, and you start looking and you and you see like, and people like, people. Aliens. I, no, they're, they're literally, I think they're from the abyss. No, I, I and people always talk yeah, to me like, you know, a lot of people I know who've worked with Jim 
And they go, Jim gets frustrated on set when you can't do things the way he wants to do it. But the thing is that he can do your job better than you and everybody else's job almost better because he's he's not he's he's not he's at a completely different level. Different level, different level. No, I wanted. No, he's a tough guy on the set. He's he's tough. But by the way, but John Landau is so. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. He smooths things over. He (laughs) reminds me. You know, he's a great example of of being that person. You know, um, that can help smooth things out. You know, Uh, you know Robert can get frustrated at times. You know, too. It's because by the way, everything. Nobody else in that set. If Robert doesn't wake up and get that thing moving and tells them where to go. Nothing nothing goes. And that's the director. And that's what I try to impart into directors. It's like, so you, and I also even tell them, it's like, you need, once you're finished, I told Lance, I said, we was finished shooting. And I said, I need you to take the week off and cool your brain down. Feed your brain, relax your brain, because you have been on a daily gauntlet for mm. months now, you know? Yeah. And you have to, and I'm glad that Jim takes time in between things. And that helps him. Too many, too yeah. many, too many years, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, he's 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 bordering Kubrick now at this point in the game. I mean, it's like, yeah, <laughs> Jim, it's 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 enough, Jim. Let's can we just get them out, please? <laughs> you know, each one. I, that's one of the things I love about filmmaking. And by the way, one of the most generous human beings is Quentin Tarantino, who I adore. And we were in Desperado. He said to me that somebody asked him. You know, again, people throwing trash. Is, you know, in the oh way. God! Oh, talk about talk about hate! Really, yeah. oh, my so God! Quentin, and Quinton said, you know, they, they asked him. He said, "So what are you going to do next?" He just finished Pulp Fiction, won the Palme d'Or. The thing was going on in theaters, and uh, and he was acting in Desperado. And we were sitting around. And he goes, "Listen, but you have no idea." People ask me, "What what, what are you doing next?" And I tell them, "I'm going to take a couple of years off." And this person goes, "You can you can afford to take a couple of years off." And Quinton looked at them and said, because they're a filmmaker that was actively making films. Yeah. And he says, you can't. <laughs> Quinton lived so simply and he still does, you know, mm-hmm. so simply, you know, he still was renting the apartments where he would have been living forever in Crescent Heights, you know, at that point. And uh, driving in the little Geo Metro that he got from the money he got for uh, natural born killers, you know, 30,000 mm-hmm. he got for that. And uh, so when he said those words to me, he goes, and then people go, you know, oh, they're throwing trash at people. And he goes, I want my friends to make great films because I can only make one every two or three years. He goes, <laughs> so, and I love going to the movies. So why wouldn't I want my friends, why would I support my friends in making good movies? You know? What a and great thought, comment. Yeah. Exactly. That was Desperado. A- that was back in the day. And he still has the same ethos. He's still that person. And I love that. You know, he still loves going to the movies. I mean, seeing him stop for a moment with a bunch of kids when he's coming out of the, you know, the arc light or whatever, you know, and talk to them. They're just standing around and he just came out of a movie and they're like, Quinn, don't you just talk to us? I'm like, yeah, that's I'm awesome. sure he did. Um, Which that's... is awesome, you know? It's awesome. You know, that's to be amazing. that person still. Rick Linklater is the same way. Oh, Rick is, Rick is, Rick is I, I love, is, love Rick. I, I would, I, by the way, that's rather it's funny because I don't get to choose. I didn't get to choose with Robert what themes movies I would make. I, I would I would have dreamed to have been the producer of the Before Trilogy. Oh! <laughs> I, I, or Boyhood or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Anyway, and he knows it, by the way. I, he gave me original posters and signed them and everything because he knows how I feel but about his movies in general, but also about that trilogy to me is just oh, so it's, oh, it's beautiful. beautiful. Just, oh, it's beautiful. And uh, talking to Rick when I when and I, boyhood, yeah, <laughs> no, when, when I had Rick on the show and and I had the pleasure of talking to him for a couple hours, he was so generous with his time. He's so uh, he's, so... he's such an artist. He is just such a he is consummate. like he's a consummate artist. And the one thing he said, best advice I ever heard. One of the best pieces of advice. I always ask people, "What's your advice?" And he's like, "However long it's gonna take, you think it's gonna take, it's gonna be twice as long and twice as hard." And it was like brilliant, 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 brilliant. And even for him, you know. Oh, and it's still it's still a struggle. He still I was talking to him the other day. By the way, every struggle. movie is. I, I tell people, don't think that because you've made all those movies and you now have a studio deal, whatever the hell you know you think you have. No, it's still going to be hard. To still get a hustle. The right. It's still a hustle. It's exactly. still a hustle. And the right 
combination of, and by the way, and with me, I'm one of those people that I'm always bringing the ones that are supposed to be here and take the ones out that are not supposed to be. I'm, I'm in that process the whole time. So I'm never like sad when an actor can't or decides not to or whatever. Or right, says, no, right. this isn't for me. I'm always like, that's not the person that's supposed to be here, you know? And so they come in and out and then it begins to shape up. You know, Lance, we've been working on, on uh, Deadland for a couple of years because, you know, we, they got jobs. I got jobs. I mean, mm-hmm. I got stuff to do too, you mm-hmm. know? And so someday we all had our jobs, you know, being DPs and things and editors and, Stop. you know, and being then... first ADs and, you know, and I was always kind of the one there making sure that we were trying to get the right cast, you know, because the cast had to be just right. And, um, and then Lance said to me back in April, he said, Elizabeth, so he said, oh, we're going to start such and such a date. And it never felt right for me, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I was like, OK, oh, OK, perfect. Sure. Um, and then he said in April, he said, so Jim is going to go off and do Crater. J- Josh Shelton is the mm-hmm. thing. I said, and then after that, he's going to free himself up and we're going to go do uh, the movie. So we're going to start September 27th. And I can't tell you how it was almost like whoosh, it just hit me just hit me like this is it this is, we're moving we're going this is it. like it, you know and it's been a couple of years you know covid kind of stopped the flow of sure it, you know and i went it's september 27th that's what we're doing that is exactly what that's what we're we gotta go toward that let's go you know and then at one point you know we we're running a little behind and some stuff happened and and I, you know, they were like, well, maybe we'll push. And I said, if we don't start September 27th, it's going to fall apart. You got to go. And we started September 27th. And, and I'm so glad we did. Because, no, no. by the way, it's the first day of Mercury in retrograde, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, the wildest thing is Robert with Hypnotic, which had fallen apart because of COVID last year, mm-hmm. started September 27th also. There was something about that date. It's really? really important. Good. And hypnotic start that day too, you know, at the studio. I was up in Oklahoma doing it, but but yeah. So there was something about that. You know how you know that you know. Mm, uh, but you have there's... to have the understanding <sighs> that that's gonna happen. And you have to have the faith I, that I, that's I, gonna happen. I have that, to add that day, uh-huh. that moment's gonna come when it all coalesces. And man, when it does is like lightning in a bottle, you know. When can I have to ask you? You, I mean, you seem like a person who really listens to their instincts, listens to their gut a lot. And it, and as I've gotten older in life, I've realized how important listening to my inner voice is and, and those feelings. And especially like what you just said, like, no, it's September 27th. Like, how, and when other people don't understand what's going on, you're like, no, 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 no. That's when it's happened. The importance of under, listening to your inner voice as a creative and as a producer. So, so important. Would you agree? Yes. By the way, it's truly what has guided me. Um, and, and it's a thing that is elusive mm-hmm. because it's, you know, because sometimes you question it. Sometimes you know, like throughout the process with Lance and then COVID happens and then no, no, all no. this happens. Right. Um, you, you're like, that, that moment, you have to know that that moment, and Lance will be like, okay, you know, because it's a filmmaker, he's trying to lift it up as hard, you know, as he could. And it's funny because we talked about it, and he goes, Elizabeth, when you said it's September 27th, back in April, that's when I, I knew, I knew, because I knew that you knew, you know, <laughs> and so you're like, yes, you know, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a moment of like the synergy of it. Yeah. I don't know why I thought September 27th would be the moment. But by is. the way, I had no idea we would go into a whole uh, new wave of COVID. I mean, Jesus. I mean, it just got thick, man. And uh, so you're like, no, no, we're going to. I did a movie during COVID with no vaccines the year before. And uh, totally. But we really, really became like a the bubble. A, yeah. A camp, a, bu- a real bubble. Nobody left. Uh, it, but it was a very simple movie with six actors total that four of them were the adults and that was it. And um, so the blazing world. And I, um, so, it, and that one it was filmmakers that I 
didn't know. I, I met them along the way, but Carlson Young is just a beautiful uh, writer and a beautiful young woman and a really great director that is, I'm sure she's going to have a beautiful career. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, but with Lance, it was, we've been together for 10 years in the, the couple of scripts that, you know, several things that he's written and just a friendship and That's um, a real, real connection. And his wife's from Panama. And uh, she's hilarious. And they, they used to live in Santa Clarita, you know, for right. a time, uh, about a, until about about nine months ago. T- no, beginning of a year. So about a year ago. And he decided he was coming home. And she's from Austin. She grew up in Austin. Her mom's Panamanian, uh, Rose, Rose Larson. And she um, she was like, I- I'm not coming back to L.A. Done. I'm not. And, uh, you know, talk about the gut, you know. Um, and she and he's still working at Fox and then everything shuts down. So he's working out of his house. He's like, what am I doing here? My family is back there. I'm here, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so he moved this way. And uh, by the way, but before that, Rose had said no more, brought her kids. They were in Texas. And uh, the school that their son was going to start freshman year in, uh, there was a shootout, a bunch of a shooter, an active shooter. Uh, oh first God. week of school. Oh my God! And so many of their little friends, and that's when Lance realized his wife had a gut, too, and was like, she knew something I didn't know, you know. And so I have to start listening to. to oh that, my God! You know, really listen. So, so he moved. The funny thing is, I call them from Austin. I won't tell them what to do. You know, you know what I mean? I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, they'll know. And then so he finished. He moved in, and I was like, so where did you move to? And he goes, oh, we ended up in Lakeway, Rough Hollow. So I was like, you're seven miles from my house. Like, <laughs> <laughs> literally down the street. And uh, so down the high. So it's pretty funny, you know, that people, you just let them be. And so it's been fun, you know, because we could right. deal with things, you know, from here, from this side of the town. No. And, uh, and work hard, you know, and his kids are doing amazing at, at Lake Travis. And, yeah, yeah. you know, because they, they have programs that they don't have in Los Angeles. I know, I know. I mean, I know, amazing. I know. The, so I'm going to ask you a few questions because I know we can keep talking and I, I please, I want to invite you back in a future time to keep talking to you. I absolutely yeah, adore absolutely. talking to you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all of my guests. Um, yeah. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Start with a great story script. Don't tell me you have a half written script. Finish. I have an idea. I have an idea. An idea. Everybody has a, we all have stories. We all, we all have, have ideas. Stories. We're yeah. storytellers by nature. Um, and uh, so put it down on paper. Even if it, then you write, write a, a memoir, write something, put it together, have an IP that you can leverage uh, as a filmmaker, because that's the best way, you know, or, you know, that story has to be something that you can make for very little money. You know, if possible, I'm not saying seven thousand, but something that you understand and can carry out to get that first movie out there. You're going to learn a lot uh, in the process. Make a lot of short films. Maybe even make a short film about that particular subject matter. That's what Carlson Young was able to show me that she was a filmmaker. You know, she had a short based on the movie, a little piece of it. That then, when I read the script, it made sense, and it had gone to Sundance. So right. she already had made some and that's how you start and that's i really believe that if you don't really learn those lessons by making shorts getting in there knowing how to tell stories in 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 moving pictures Mm -hmm. no matter what format it is Mm -hmm. if it's animation if it's whatever then you're going in a little green you have to have that as a filmmaker if you want to be a filmmaker um, a director, uh, you know, uh, even a producer, you have to understand how to do that. Um, so that's my okay. biggest advice. That's great advice. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? In life. <laughs> <laughs> to trust that something above you will guide you. And, and really, truly be able to give that over. And in Spanish, we say something, te preocupada, you know, I'm preoccupied. Oh, see. <laughs> mom used to always say, no te preocupes, ocúpate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, pre, the preoccupied, don't do that. The, let let go, let 
thing let the universe move it let let have the the knowledge and confidence that if your heart um you're in your passion you're in your in your your you're developing those talents that are only you we're like snowflakes when it comes to the combination of talents and what we love we, that's how we're snowflakes so if you are a person that is following that with their heart mm -hmm. i really believe that the universe god whatever you want to call it won't say no it'll either happen or it'll be not yet or it'll be i have a better plan oh <laughs> <laughs> so be open to that. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. A amen. Uh, I preach it. That's pre a hard lesson, man. Oh, and hard hard tell, tell me about it. Uh, you know, how many of us Ooh. listening... How many of us listening are always thinking like, I want this to happen, this to happen, and this to happen? And, and from, from my experience, and I'm sure yours as well, first of all, it never happens how you want it to happen. Most of the times it happens in a different way that's better. And it might not be, a, and it, it might not be apparent when it happens, but in hindsight, you're like, oh, I didn't get that job. I'm, just, I'm devastated. Like I got, I, I, was in, um, I was in Project Greenlight. Uh, in season two, I, I made it to the top 25, but I didn't get onto the show. And I was devastated that I, I, got, I got to the very, like right there, and I didn't get in. It was devastated. And then after I saw what happened on the show, I was like, man, I, I dodged a bullet. I'm so glad I didn't become that director because I, I, didn't, want, I didn't want to be that person. So there's things that happen at, at a moment in time that you think that, oh God, it's the end of the world. But really, it, you know, it happens. Her plan. There's always a better, there's a better plan. And that's when you have to kind to of trust. trust that, you know, to trust that. I think, you know, I always say I, both my parents went away and they each one taught me a huge lesson on their way. My mom, she was 58 years old. Oh, wow. 96. And she, it was the process of the last seven weeks of her life were so hard and so beautiful that she gave me the gift of not being afraid to die. Like be able to just go. Oh, it's just okay. And then that year, a movie, again, a movie called Antonia's Line gave me the language of what I had been. It won the Academy Award that year for Best Foreign Films, a Dutch film. And this woman called it The Miracle of Death. And that's what I had seen a month before. Wow. Um, so, it, you know, so to, to experience that and know that it's just a change of status, because my mom's been in my life. Unbelievable. I mean, people can tell you the stories from this past movie. My mom shows up as a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes smell. But in this movie, the past three or four days, she like, transmogrified herself. I, I literally go around. I'll show you. One second. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I, I carry around mm -hmm. every movie, every time I travel. Uh -huh, a little skunk. skunk. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got in Paris a long time ago. Uh -huh. uh, I have two of them. One travels, one stays on my desk. Just in case. Taking care of my kids. Yes. And, and I'll tell you, it was insane. The last, uh, the last, uh, sorry, the last uh, two days, uh, it was insane. And then my father passed away in 2018, and I took care of him the last seven months. Very interesting. My mom was seven, seven weeks. weeks and seven weeks. My dad months. was seven months. We were seven kids. Oh, wow. um, and uh, the last seven months, my father had a very, you know, difficult time. It was, it wasn't, it was a heart failure, but just odd and all that stuff. But. Um, that was a person that dabbled in meditation, you know, like, sure. you know, yoga, meditation, I, I do it, you know, but because of my dad and I was the only person at that point taking care of him a lot of the time by myself, I woke up early every morning to be able to be present for him. Whatever was going on with him, I had to be ready. And uh, so amazing training for seven months, anything you do for seven months and consistently it's going to stay you're going to see the difference and feel the difference within you when you don't have that, when you haven't done that. So I do that no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening. I wake up a couple of, when it's call time, I wake up a couple hours before so that I can do that and then be present, you know, and that's a huge gift. So those are the lessons that are the learned lessons, the, the, right. but it's comes from that place, you know, 
yeah. to be present for a whole crew, no matter what happens, because some stuff goes south, man, sometimes. In- <laughs> and as a producer, if you don't have the wherewithal to 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 be center right there, you know, like just and, and be able to handle it in a calm manner. It's it can be hectic, oh, you know. I, I've been t- I've been I've been telling my audience for years that I've been meditating uh, heavily, heavy, I think two two hours a day at least, every day, and it's changed my life. It changed my life when it's I started meditating. It, 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 I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> if if you have if you have a problem, if you have a question, meditate, and a lot of times the answer comes to you in the meditation. It's it's pretty remarkable. It's really really remarkable. And la- it's a and, beautiful way to live. And yes. last question: three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, gosh. I love so many of them. Gosh. Mm-hmm. Three that come to mind right now. <laughs> Three that come to mind immediately. You know, um, Lawrence of Arabia, definitely, because yeah. I got to see a couple of years ago and presented to my kids. Um, it was a brand new 70 millimeter. I saw it. The- I saw it in L.A. I saw it in L.A. I saw that print, the 70 millimeter print in L.A. At the um, brand new. Oh my God, it was gorgeous. I it was saw it here at the Paramount. It oh, was it's gorgeous. Here at the oh, it's gorgeous. Unbelievable. Gorgeous. It was, and again, transporting yourself back to that child, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, then another seminal, seminal moment was a movie that could have me standing as a, as a little girl. This is when I really fell in love with movies Oliver. Oh, the yeah. Oliver. Oliver, yeah. From based on the Oliver Twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember so, I mean, being a little girl and seeing this kid go through this journey. And being so moved and Rex Reed and, and the, it was so heavy. It was a heavy film. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it as a kid. And I, whew, I mean, the images still. Oh, know, yeah. Get me oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think I'm going to mention, well, the trilogy from Rick, those were given, I already mentioned those. But I think one that I just thought, geez, man, that's something else. Waking Life. Oh, Rick. Rick's wake- yeah. That movie, it's one of those, you know? Yeah. When you watch it again, you're like, wow, what I thought a few years back is, I think, different, you know? Because yeah. it was such a weird, dreamlike. And I just thought, what well, the guts to do that. You know? Oh, no. The, gu- the, the guts that he has to do anything, all the films that he does, like. Boyhood, my God. You know, like, to have the foresight to do something like that, my God, I love it. I mean, so much. and that, that there was, there <laughs> was a, of, anyway, he's one of my favorite human beings. Let's just begin. He's with a that. sweet, you know, like he's, humans. He's and then just such a sweet one man. of my favorite filmmakers and to, for it to be in, in this person that, I mean, I love Bernie. I, it depends on the person, Bernie, which yeah. one I recommend Bernie. Rick's oeuvre to uh, the, the sheriff in, in the little town in Oklahoma. I was yeah. like, you gotta see Bernie, man. You gotta oh, see Bernie. Bernie's great. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, uh, so yeah. So it's, you know, it, it, there are filmmakers out there that are just transcendent. And I thought, I think I have to say Django. Of all, although I have to kind of go by filmmakers. Django is one of my, it's my favorite of Quinton's. Is my, it? My personal. Re- it used to be uh, Reservoir Dogs, believe it, it or used, not. And yeah. then Django. Django for me. God, I love Django, Because it was Django, so man. like, crazy like wow what a yarn for me for me for me and for me for quentin i have to say it's once upon a time in hollywood but it's just because it's it is it's everything as a filmmaker it's everything it's just like he's it's it's his love letter to la it's his love letter to hollywood it's totally and it was just so it was just this and that and it was by the way those two probably might too yeah, and, and Django is not too far behind. Yeah, and Inglorious, I love Inglorious too. And Inglorious, oh uh, my God, Inglorious was great. By the way, there's so many. But I mean, a... I love so many films and so many filmmakers. I just admire the form. Um, I, I'm part of the Academy, so sure. I've signed up, and I signed up again this year to to judge the um, uh, to be the 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 one that takes on like the task of the foreign films, you know, oh, um, wow. to to nominate. Um, I'm part of the producers branch, and that's just something extra you can do as. And let me tell you, oh, during the COVID, you the best thing of all was knowing <laughs> yeah. that filmmaking and storytelling was alive and well. I saw films from the most incredible. This, if you haven't seen this film, mm-hmm. Neon bought it. It's called The Night of the Kings. Oh, wow. From Ivory Coast. <gasps> and it said, oh, prison movie. Like, again, like border movie. So not a prison movie. Yeah. Watch that. Okay. <gasps> It's wow. like it's like Shawshank's so, like yeah. like Shawshank's a prison movie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
So, you know, I, I, I just, I love, I love, I'm one of those people that the thing I miss the most from COVID, from the whole period of this situation has been, I go to the movies, lunch and a movie by myself, at least once a week, if not twice. Yeah. Um, Alamo Draft House, Violet Crown. Yeah. I just, yeah, yeah. you know, literally make a, I'm going to a meeting. So I schedule what's, what's playing. And then I, I kind of make a di- uh, afternoon of it. I miss, I, and, I, I, uh, I miss doing that. You know, and I love that, you know, by myself, by myself. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, one o'clock, whatever, you know, and um, and that's been the thing I miss the most. And I also think, wow, but I saw those foreign films. Each one was magical. My God. La Llorona from Guatemala. Oh, my God. I can't wait to see that. That... By the way, El Agente Topo from Chile, Uh that documentary. How the hell did she do that? I mean, oh my like, god! I can't wait to see these things. Infiltrate in this manner. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, I saw incredible movies that I was in awe. I mean, like oh my god! Awe. Oh my god! <laughs> so anyway, so filmmaking is alive and well all thank, over the world. Thank God for that, because we need stories now more than ever, forever. Elizabeth, I, I, honestly, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor talking to you Absolutely. today. It has been so Absolutely. wonderful. The energy and the words of wisdom that you've you've dropped on on the audience and i really hope that this helps a lot of people out there listening to it and gives people hope um and everyone and of course we set this record straight on a mariachi which was very important uh <laughs> but truly the inspiration that that you and robert have given generations of filmmakers over the years has been um it has been remarkable so thank you so much for everything you do and you will have to come back cuz i know we could talk for another Five yeah, hours. <laughs> but thank and you so much way, for being. Uh, we'll talk. Some people that you should interview that are really like my. One of them is Jeff Fahey. He's one yes. of like my brother. Oh, been, yeah. He was just here in Austin doing uh, doing hypnotic. He's a dear. I love I mean, Jeff. Robert I love I Jeff. I love adore Jeff. him. He's such an amazing. He's his brain is just oh, no, who he is. It. It's it's so interesting. You know, we brought him out of Afghanistan when we were doing uh, Planet Terror. Yeah. Rebel without a crew. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I truly want to thank Elizabeth for coming on the show and sharing her journey with the tribe today. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 175. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly, truly helps us out a lot. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 